Good evening, everybody. We'd like to call the order of the roll um, of um, the Board of Supervisors meeting for May 19th, 2020. And first thing we'd like to do is have a roll call by Emily. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter. Ms. Oates. Aye. Mr. Fox. Here. Ms. Colors. Here. Mr. Mabe. Here. Next on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next thing on our agenda is uh, the adoption of the agenda, looking for uh, additions or deletions. Mr. Chairman, I've got an item regarding the Scotland of the State Sanitary District tax rate for 2020. I apologize um, not being able to get this out earlier. I was trying to work things out with uh, Mr. Ham today. I'll be glad to explain that. But if we could add it as item P1 on the regular agenda. T1? P. Oh, he is in Paul 1. Yes, sir. Um, I also have um, a deletion. That's uh, item number M, which is the request for Chris, Chris Ramsey for the boundary adjustment. We'd like to have that removed and put on the agenda for our first meeting in June. Chairman? Yes, ma'am. This is divorce. Um, so you recused yourself from the vote on that, so would it not be um, uh, more in line with that recusal to allow Ms. Colors to remove that from the agenda? I don't have any problem with that. Ms. Colors, would you like to re remove it from the agenda? Actually, I'd like to get it over with, personally. <laughs> I we can hear you, Jason. I that's my personal feeling is that I don't understand what putting it off is going to change the, the vote that much. I mean, I, for me, it won't. And I share Ms. Culler's opinion on this, um, Mr. Chairman. I think that it's, I, I don't see any reason to delay this, I, unless you have a specific reason, but since you, um, you know, decided to abstain, I, I didn't know that you wanted any input into this decision. That's fine. I do have an input when um, Mr. Rems gave me a personal phone call and asked to be it, for it to be removed. Sure. And, and I, I don't know, Jason, uh, is there any um, particular protocol that we follow if someone has abstained or refused themselves from a just from a decision with terms of removing this uh, from from the agenda. Well, what was the reason for you deciding not to uh, be involved in this, Mr. Chairman? Um, because Mr. Ramsey has been a personal friend for years, and we have had we have shared meals, we have shared church, we have shared understanding together, and. In our past situations where the um, board theoretically, and I'm not saying that they did or didn't, they could have done things for friends just because they were asked to do it. I'm not going to be part of that. And uh, I respect Mr. Ramsey a lot, and I respect our board, and I don't want to be a part of a decision that could uh, tarnish the board in any way at all. All right, so, you know, the... the you're not in business with Mr. Ramsey. No, correct? sir, I am not. You don't own any company with him. There's no real conflict of interest. Here. Is that right? That is correct. I'll close the door. Hang on a second. So, you know, the, the legal answer is that, uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you can do what you want to because you're not conflicted under COYA. 
However, Mrs. Oates makes a good point. If you believe that because of your personal friendship with him that you should not be involved, uh, and if that is your your stated belief, then you should not be involved. But you know that that is very much for you to decide, Mr. Chairman. You're not prohibited from doing so, but it, it would. I, I don't think I was. I don't remember if I was at the meeting where you recused yourself for other things with respect to Mr. Ramsey, and, and it would be logically inconsistent to, to exclude yourself then and not now, but I don't think it would be illegal if, if you wanted to make that motion to amend the agenda. Um, uh, you would not be prohibited from doing so under the, the Conflict of Interest Act, but it would be logically inconsistent, as Mrs. Oates has pointed out. And, and I have one more point. So it, it's my understanding that the town has made this request. So this is um, the town requesting us to consider a boundary adjustment, not Mr. Ramsey. So um, how does that impact uh, what we're discussing at this point on the agenda? Yeah, um, I, I think it's probably absolutely the town is involved. I think it's probably fair to say that both parties have requested it. And then one party is requesting that it be removed, and so that's a good point as well. So if you choose for me not to uh, amend the agenda, that's fine. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, if I still abstain, and we need um, we need four people to actually go to vote on it, and with Mr. Carter not available to us, we don't have that. Because if Mr. Um, Mr. Fox is at the Oh, hi, Tony. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate you joining. No, I'm sorry. It's just, you know, I think the tower went down around 6. Knocked out the phones down there and knocked out my internet. And I was trying to get my internet back warm. But, you know, I was, I had, I, I, I've caught most of the work session. But I heard my name, so my ears were burning. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, if one of you is at, it's three people required, three supervisors required to you know, to carry motions and pass ordinances, et cetera, regardless of whether or not one member is absent. But um, I guess you need to decide, Mr. Chairman, whether or not you want to withdraw your motion to modify the agenda or not. And, and if you want to do that, then you can do that either way. And, uh, and then maybe inquire as to whether or not there's any other changes to the agenda. And then we vote on it and, and go from there. I'm willing to withdraw my uh, motion. All right, so then the, the agenda has got the one edition of the Skyline States that uh, uh, Mr. Stanley has stated on the record. And point of clarification, did you add that to the consent agenda or the regular agenda? P1. P1, thank you. I apologize. Well, I make the motion then that we accept the agenda as uh, modified by Mr. Stanley. Is there a second? I'll second that. All those in favor? Uh, could I get a roll call, please? Mr. Carter? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Mabe? I abstain. And I, and I apologize about my laughter when uh, Ms. <laughs> Oates did, didn't agree with you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, I was, that was unexpected from my perspective. I, I guess it wasn't funny, and I apologize for that. Oh, actually, it was Miss Colors. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, next thing on our, on our agenda. Is the, um, oh, shoot, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Yeah, this is for our public comment period. Um, Emily, is, have you received any comments? Yes, so I have received several comments, and they are all regarding the proposed uh, boundary adjustment on Guard Hill Road, so I will read them in the order they were received. Uh, first up is Miss Susan Glasscock of 35 Jackson Place. I'm contacting you in reference to the proposed townhouses to be built on Guard Hill Road. 
There are many reasons that I can list as to why this is a terrible location, and I am opposed for such a development. Guard Hill Road is not constructed for the additional traffic. It is what I would call a country road. Curvy, narrow, and there are blind spots. At the intersection of 340, 522, and Guard Hill, there would have to be a traffic light, but what about the residents entering and exiting Guard Hill Road? I can just envision the danger of the additional traffic. It's just not safe. I travel on this road daily, so I am very aware of the traffic and issues that exist already. I cannot even imagine the scenario of this additional volume of vehicles traveling on Guard Hill Road. Also, with 150 units, we have to consider the impact on our fire and rescue, schools, and traffic. I think Mr. Ramsey could develop a townhouse community elsewhere in the town slash county that would be more suitable of a location. The housing in our area is needed, but not on Guard Hill Road. Next is from Robert and Mary Dye of 938 River Ridge Drive. My wife and I are 15-year residents of the North River District and reside at 938 River Ridge Drive. We understand applications have been submitted to Warren County and the Board of Supervisors for review on May 19th regarding a proposed apartment complex. My wife and I oppose this project. We travel Guard Hill Road routinely as the primary route to access our community. It is our understanding that Mr. Ramsey has submitted a request to Warren County to construct a 150-unit apartment complex, which will be located on the north side of Guard Hill Road near U.S. Highway 34522. We understand Mr. Ramsey is also requesting through Warren County to obtain the authorization and recommendation that his property be provided municipal water and sewer services by the town of Front Royal. The area cannot and should not support the intended project and would overburden the existing area's infrastructure. Conservatively, 150 apartments, assuming an average of two people per apartment, equates to at least 300 residents and 150 plus automobiles. In many cases, renters share or more than one family resides in an apartment unit, and the minimum number of vehicles can be expected to exceed one per unit. All of this adds to congestion at an already dangerous intersection at Guard Hill Road and U.S. Highway 34522. Some traffic will undoubtedly seek other ingress slash egress routes to Guard Hill Road to avoid congestion. Reliance Road, Ridnour Hollow Road, and North River Road, all alternate routes to Guard Hill Road, are not designed for volume traffic. This creates further congestion and safety-related issues as Guard Hill Road has numerous blind areas, is usually narrow, and portions of it along the North River and Ridnour Hollow do not meet the state criteria for centerline striping, nor do they have shoulders for safety on either side. In all, Guard Hill Road and North River Road and Renauer Hollow Road are all a current danger to travel. Nighttime travel presents an even greater safety risk. Regarding Front Royal providing water and sewage to this site, we have additional concerns. We are concerned about the burden Front Royal will have to place on its water processing and sewage handling capacities and capabilities. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, on average, each person in this country with access to above-ground water uses 80 to 100 gallons of water per day. Assuming only 300 people reside in the subject complex, that equates to 10,950,000 gallons of water per year to be supplied to this complex. It will require Front Royal to process a similar amount of sewage per year. Based on the town of Front Royal's current water and sewage treatment rates, I question if this proposed complex will generate enough fee and tax revenue to convince the town to accommodate Mr. Ramsey's request. In summary, we are opposed to the construction of a 150-unit apartment complex at the proposed location see no tangible benefit for Warren County or the town of Front Royal. Next is from Mr. Clayton Downs of 101 Thomas Drive, just off Guard Hill Road. I am totally against the building of the housing project of Mr. Ramsey. The amount of new traffic over 1,000 more per day above the existing traffic will hinder getting onto Route 522 and will be a real problem. The extra school students to AS Rhodes Elementary School will put a burden on our school system. I understand there are other parcels of land in the county or town that would suit this need better, with better traffic and school situations. I strongly urge both the county supervisors and the town to reject this proposal. Next is Ms. Patricia Failmesker of 636 River Ridge Drive. I am opposed to the annexation. We have a comprehensive plan for a reason. That land is zoned agricultural and is in the county. If this annexation is allowed, more developers will expect the same treatment. Mr. Ramsey's plan is to build 150 rental apartments on that property if it is annexed to the town. High-density housing belongs close in town where the infrastructure can handle it. Guard Hill Road and up and down 522, 340. I live off Guard Hill Road in the River Ridge Division. Oh, I apologize. I skipped a line. My apologies. High-density housing belongs close in town where the infrastructure can handle it. Guard Hill Road cannot handle the traffic that this would generate. 150 apartments generate how many car trips per day? 
600, the intersection of 34522 would be a disaster and there would be backups on Guard Hill Road and up and down 34522. I live off Guard Hill Road in the River Ridge Division. We bought the property in 1995 and have been living here since 2002. Guard Hill Road in Front Royal has seen increased traffic every year since we have been here. It has become almost impossible to turn left off Guard Hill Road onto 34522. I cannot imagine a worse scenario for Mr. Ramsey's property. He has continued to move dirt on it as though he was certain of getting what he wants. Why? How? Annexation resulting in 150 rental apartments is a nightmare. The only one who benefits is Mr. Ramsey. This is not the empty frontier anymore. We have to consider the well-being of everyone. Next is from Linda Bartlett of 167 Jackson Place. She simply says, I vote no to these homes on a tiny country road. Next is from the River Ridge Property Owners, Asso Property Owners Association Board of Directors, which includes Julian Pettengill, George Hagel, George Rogers, Patricia Failmesker, and Brian Knight. We, the Board of Directors of the River Ridge Property Owners Association, are writing to express our strong opposition to the proposed annexation of property owned by Mr. Chris Ramsey located at 3853 Guard Hill Road into the town limits of Front Royal, Virginia. The River Ridge on the Shenandoah community is located off Guard Hill Road, which provides our main access route to the 34522 corridor and the town of Front Royal. The stated purpose of the proposed annexation is to allow Mr. Ramsey to build 150 fair market rate apartments that would be connected to the town's water and sewer lines at the much lower in-town connection fee levels. Mr. Ramsey previously proposed a similar annexation on April 3, 2015. At its meeting on September 20th, 2016, a previous Board of Supervisors considered the proposed annexation and adopted a resolution which described their reasons for rejecting the proposal. That resolution was included in the packet of materials you reviewed at your work session on May 12, 2020. Although the particulars of the currently proposed construction differ somewhat from the 2015 proposal, suggesting more rental units and a somewhat different mix of likely occupants, all of the issues identified by the previous board in its resolution remain unchanged. With the main circumstances unchanged, we believe that you should reach the same conclusion as the preceding board and decline to accept the proposed annexation. Having read the materials in the packet for your May 12, 2020 work session, we are struck by the tone of the discussion as if the fate of the proposed annexation and construction project was solely about various numbers, additional school children to receive educational services and related pressure on local school capacity, which for the local elementary school is already above the stated maximum, additional road trips per day on Guard Hill Road, doubling current traffic loads, additional gallons of water consumed and pressure on the town's wastewater and treatment capacity. It's easy to understand why that is so. Government leaders need metrics to help evaluate the impact and desirability of potential development projects. Buried in the discussion, but only implicitly and very indirectly, are both the community values adopted in the county's comprehensive plan and various potential opportunity costs associated with approving this project. Entirely absent from the discussion is any sense of how the daily lives of the surrounding residents in either the county or the town would be affected by the proposed development. Nor is there any apparent consideration of the impact of the development on future tax rates or service fees for county and town residents. Instead, the overall flavor of the documents is technical. How can the county, town, and VDOT accommodate the desires of the developer as if the real and as if the real direct and indirect costs to surrounding residents, because they are not easily measured, are not material? The discussion also lacks more than a brief mention of how the county's planning goals might be better met by a similar project implemented on a different property that is already within the town's borders. The main beneficiary of the proposed annexation is Mr. Ramsey, who would gain much lower hookup fees for water and sewer, allowing him, perhaps, to charge lower apartment rents than might otherwise be the case, with potentially higher rental occupancy and greater profit. Or, more likely, if market rental rates are higher, he would simply garner higher profits. All other parties to the transaction would obtain little or no benefit and, very likely, higher costs for at least some government-provided services. Perhaps as many as 150 people slash households might benefit somewhat by having an expanded choice of rental housing, but what fraction of that number would be county residents and whether the apartment rents actually would be affordable for young teachers, other workforce people, or elderly people not in need of assisting living arrangement are complete unknowns. Meanwhile, the impact on the surrounding community, especially increased traffic congestion driving into Front Royal, is totally ignored. The applicant suggests sharing in the road costs of installing a new traffic light at the Guard Hill Road intersection with 34522. While this probably would help people who want to turn left onto 34522, it would likely lengthen trips into Front Royal. 
and because we already have a series of traffic lights in close proximity in the road segment between Route 66 and the North Fork Bridge, an added traffic light at Guardhole Road is very likely to compound traffic delays and backups at peak traffic times, which would adversely affect the many people who use 34522 to commute to work. Imagine what that will be like on a Friday afternoon in the summer. The best that the town council could say about the proposal was from Councilman Meza. He added, oh, quote, he added that it seems to serve no purpose to not bring them into the town and allow the connection, end quote. With that weak endorsement, supervisors thinking of supporting annexation should only do so if they can provide a strong, positive rationale for why the benefits realized would substantially exceed the costs, not only for the county and town governments, but also for the people most directly affected. And further, why those same benefits cannot be realized at equal or lower cost by using existing property that is already within the town limits. Next is from C.N. Davis and William Hammock. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to address you, although indirectly. My name is C.N. Davis. My address is 4142 Guard Hill Road. Although I serve as a certified planning commissioner for the town of Front Royal, I am speaking for myself and Colonel William Hammock as Warren County residents to urge you to deny and decline the request by Chris Ramsey for a boundary adjustment between the town of Front Royal and the county of Warren of property off Guard Hill Road on tax map 20, zoned agricultural. The Warren County supervisors have wisely declined this request before, most recently in July 2015 and in September 2016 after receiving evidence and testimony from public safety officials, the school system, affected neighbors, and various other well-informed parties. The same conditions and concerns remain and have been worsened, including the condition and topography of Guard Hill Road cannot bear the additional traffic and the town does not have adequate maintenance capability. Guard Hill Road is already dangerous to travel with unusually narrow lanes, no regular shoulders, no lighting, hidden driveways, steep slopes, and narrow turns. Private and organizational neighbors of the proposed annexation site, such as the Elks Club, ask that annexation not go forward. Substantial changes in the 34522 slash Guard Hill Road intersection, including the addition of lights, configuration, and management, would be needed at the intersection of Guard Hill Road, where it can already take up to 15 minutes to achieve a left turn onto 34522. Mr. Ramsey has offered no solution for this. Front Royal Fire and Rescue Operations could not safely gain speedy access and adequate response to the proposed location. The visual impact of the entrance corridor of Routes 34522 would be even more adversely impacted. Mr. Ramsey has already destroyed a substantial part of this delicate, agriculturally zoned, mostly karst terrain by digging out large slices from the portion of the steep hillside visible in the Route 34522 entrance corridor, the equivalent of strip mining leaving large uncovered areas exposed and creating large further erosion zones. He has sold a substantial portion of the hillside as fill dirt, with the hauling trucks leaving large mud zones on Guard Hill Road that created a wet weather hazard. Mr. Ramsey has not offered restrictions to assure that only senior housing would be built, and the school system impact would likely be expensive and substantial. Mr. Ramsey has not offered any assistance with the financial impact to either the town or the county. He has not provided a site plan. He has not confirmed a proposed number of units, although the number 100, 10 buildings, 10 units each, has been mentioned. There has been no qualified and objective environmental impact study, just Mr. Ramsey offering his own opinions. This annexation and proposed development violate the most recent Warren County Comprehensive Plan, which includes limited suburban crawl, excuse me, sprawl in rural or agricultural areas where adequate public facilities do not exist or their provision would not be cost effective, preserving open space and farmland, discouraging development in environmentally sensitive areas with natural development constraints where there are steep slopes and karst terrain, requiring developers to pay a fair share of the associated costs for additional facilities and services generated by development before approval, and forbidding easements serving three or more residential dwelling units with a slope greater than 15%. The stripped areas are not stable in flattened areas. This facility is not needed for the current population and housing growth estimates, having already been more than covered by previously approved projects elsewhere. Again, for these substantial reasons and for the good of the town and the county citizens' safety and financial stability, and recognizing capacity limitation on town and water, town sewer and water capabilities, we strongly urge you to turn down this annexation request. And finally, uh, from Mr. Gary Kushner, 1106 Fetchett Road. I previously provided comments for the May 5th and the May 12th Board of Supervisors meetings and won't repeat the details of that testimony which identified the many shortcomings associated with the annexation proposal, 
Suffice it to say, there is an overwhelming evidence that approving the annexation request would not be in the interest of the citizens of Warren County, and I ask that you deny the application. And those are all of the emails that I received for items on the agenda, not the subject of a public hearing. Is there anyone else on the telephone or on the computer that may want to speak? Let me check the live screen. There is no one else who's commenting, Mr. Chairman. If there's no one else that would like to speak, this would be a final call. The general public comment period is now closed. It's um, two minutes till 7.30. Uh, we, can, we could probably jump ahead uh, to the public hearings. Next on the agenda is the public hearing for um, the ordinance to delay penalties and interest upon certain local taxes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Stanley. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Chairman of the Board of Supervisors has declared local emergency during the current COVID-19 pandemic. And we've experienced widespread closures, social distancing, and recommendations to avoid public gatherings, which have created excess burdens upon the individuals and businesses of the county. In order to provide additional time for individuals and businesses to pay certain taxes without penalty, interest, and collection activities because of the emergency, the Treasurer, Commissioner of the Revenue, and I are recommending the following. That the penalty for late payment of real estate, personal property, and machinery tools taxes shall not be imposed um, until August 6, 2020. On August 6, 2020, a penalty of 10% or $10, whichever is greater, are the amount of such taxes which have not been paid shall be imposed, provided that in no case may the penalty exceed the amount of tax payable. The interest upon late payment of those taxes shall be 0% until August 6, 2020. After August 6, 2020, interest shall accrue upon such taxes and any penalties there are at a rate of 10% per annum. The provisions of this ordinance shall, not apply, shall apply only to real estate, personal property, machinery, tools, taxes that first became due on June 5th, 2020. The provisions of this ordinance shall supersede any conflicting provisions in the Warren County Code that apply to such taxes, including, without limitation, Warren County Code Section 160-26, and the passage of this ordinance shall be effective immediately. Uh, under cost and financing, reduction of revenue for two months, and loss of interest and penalties for real estate, personal property, and machinery tools that first became due on June 5th, um, we have advertised this uh, proposed ordinance for a public hearing. Obviously, uh, we are in the middle of real estate, machinery tools, and personal property tax collection. As uh, soon as the board takes action, I believe the treasurer and, and commissioner will make sure to get the word out to folks. Does the board have any questions? I would like to make one comment, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. This was carefully done notice we're not changing the due date we are setting the penalties and interest effectively at zero until August the 6th and that is done so that an escrow company that is holding somebody's money to pay taxes still has to pay the taxes because it's still still has to pay the taxes June 5th because the taxes are due June 5th uh, and that is the purpose of this uh, to not give a pass to escrow companies but perhaps people who own their home and have to suddenly pay the real estate taxes, for example, um, have a little bit extra time. Thank you, Mr. Ham. Would you like a motion, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, yes, sir. I move that the Board of Supervisors adopt. Well, All right. well don't, don't we want to open the public hearing? Oh, yeah, the public, me, excuse me. <laughs> You're way ahead of me today. <laughs> Um, the public hearing is now open. Emily, is anyone signed up? No one submitted comments, and nobody has commented on the live stream, Mr. Chairman. Is there anyone else that would like to speak at all? If, if there is no one in the audience that wants to speak, 
will consider the public hearing on this closed. What is the pleasure of the board? Would you like to have it? Yes, okay. sir. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I move that the Board of Supervisors adopt the proposed ordinance deferring penalties and interest on certain Warren County taxes until August the 6th, 2020. I'll second that. Mrs. Uh, Emily, could we get a roll call, please? Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Mr. Me? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Carter? Aye. Consider it. Next on the agenda is the public hearing for um, the ordinance assuring continuity of government in Warren County, Virginia. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, on March 24, 2020, the Board of Supervisors adopted an emergency ordinance assuring continuity of the government of Warren County, Virginia. The ordinance provides that meetings of the board and the county's other boards and commissions can be held electronically without having members of the public body or the public physically present. That public comments may be provided via email or other electronic means and other matters. The emergency ordinance is valid for 60 days and needs to be formally adopted following a public hearing by the board to be extended for another 60 days and it's the board's intention to reenact the ordinance. Attached is the ordinance as adopted by the board on March 24, 2020. I was asked earlier today by a couple board members, you know, when we thought we were going to be able to get back to what I would say is more normal uh, operations. And by normal, I mean being able to have the, the public available at our meetings. Um, I, Rick and I have talked. I certainly hope that um, with the opening of Phase 2, that, which will allow the expansion up to, uh, I believe, 50 uh, people in a room, um, and hopefully that would be at least by the second meeting in June, assuming things continue the way they've been going. Um, this will still give us some authority. If, if things were to go bad, if we had hot spots pop up, if additional action had to be taken, um, the ordinance is there to continue to cover us if we need to. But uh, obviously we'll make a decision on the opening based on available information as we move forward. Could we consider moving uh, this group out in, on our dais, whether we're having an open meeting or not? Next, next week? I, I think the problem is we don't, have, we don't have the capability of having this out there. Okay. That's the biggest issue we have with the Mondo pad. Mr. Stanley, what is the targeted date for phase two? Rick, are you still out there? Yes, sir. Can you come in, sir? Hold on, Ms. Oates. I've got Rick Farrell here. He'll come in and help the bill answer that. Thank you. You talk about phase two, and we hope to see that happen. Sure. Uh, Ma'am, the uh, governor talks uh, in terms of two to four weeks from, to go from phase one to phase two if all of the right conditions are met with the uh, metrics that he's established in his VDH team. Based on that, uh, we expect that no earlier than uh, June 8th, more likely, uh, you know, mid-June, somewhere in there, second or third week of June, we think. That's what we're expecting. It's sooner rather than later. But again, that's metric-based. Understood. Uh, but that's what we're planning on uh, here. If I hear anything else, uh, I'll certainly pass that along. Does the board have any other questions or concern? Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Mr. Chairman, I had one small correction to the agenda um, explanation and, and summary. And I, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Stanley, I didn't get a chance to chat with you about this. This says that by this action, the ordinance will be extended for another 60 days. It actually is it's more generally extended than that. It's extended and, and, and by its term, it expires six months after the disaster. And um, so the 60-day provision is what happens if you adopt an ordinance without a uh, public notice. And so now this will be adopted and, and can be used for up to six months after the disaster. And, of course, that does not stop this board from opening up its meetings whenever it is deemed uh, safe to do so. But it is uh, a little broader than, than that. Thank you, Jason, for correcting me. I appreciate it. Sure. Any additional questions or concerns about the staff? So was the previous emergency declaration not uh, 
intended for that six month duration or, or why are we redoing it? I, I'm well, there were two separate things. There was the emergency declaration that was done jointly by the board and by uh, Mr. May, the chairman and emergency management director. Uh, and that kicked in various legal powers regarding money and, and things that could be done. The ordinance assuring continuity of government is what allows this board to meet virtually without the, you know, and allows you, Mrs. Oates, to be on the phone and Tony to be on the computer and Tony to be on the phone and still conduct business. And that had to be adopted as an ordinance. Counties can only adopt ordinances uh, following public notice, done once a week for two weeks. Unless it's an emergency ordinance that's only going to be uh, enforced for 60 days. And so this obviously came on pretty quickly, um, and, all, and we were presented, county staff and, and myself, with the issue of how do we keep our clients safe and comply with the governor's order and also comply with FOIA. It was quite the dilemma for a while because FOIA requires everyone to be together, and the governor required that we were not. And obviously, the county still has to move forward. So, this ordinance assuring the continuity of government is specifically authorized in the Virginia Code, but it has to be an ordinance. And then the other rules provide that a county can only adopt an ordinance um, uh, following a public hearing once a week for two weeks, but you can do that on an emergency basis for 60 days. So, that's how we adopted the ordinance. I know it feels like a lot of separate things, but you know, there was a point to all of it. And this should be the last thing with respect to your general operations, uh, certainly with respect to being able to do things electronically. I wouldn't expect there to be another thing that would come down the bike on that. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. So, Mr. Stanley, I expressed to you earlier today that I felt like that the uh, the community is not able to petition the government the way that they need to. Uh, I think our public hearings have been an indication of that, where we've received little if no uh, input from our community. So I would much like, I, like everyone else, I'm sure, I want to see us go back to some of, to some ability to allow the community to come in and speak to us, especially during public hearings, um, as soon as possible. If we if we hit the sixteenth meeting, that will be our normal public hearing for the month of June. So um, I can certainly get with the chairman. We can reassess in our okay. at that first second week of June, and um, we'll advertise accordingly with our you know advertisements for next month as well. And would it be possible, perhaps, to do a public hearing? And I don't know if anybody, if we could do this, but given the limitations the, gover the governor set forth with a limit of 10 people in a room, if we could be in the room and have uh, individuals come in one at a time, perhaps, and be able to speak to us in person, should the, the, you know, the number of 10 still be the, the number uh, on June 16th? Is that a possibility? I think everything's possible. I think if we all of a sudden had a hot spot and had hundreds and hundreds of cases, I certainly would recommend against that. But if you know if things kind of stay the way they're currently tracking and the board is comfortable with having the interaction between the public and staff, the good news is we've said, I think over the last week, our plan is to open the building up sure. beginning on June 8th to our rest of our offices. <laughs> So if that's the case, I think it's a lot less of an issue uh, once we reach that threshold. Again, that's our target date. Um, if something changes, if, if the uh, rates of infection, if the number of local cases were to change dramatically, then maybe we'd have to reconsider that. But my hope would be we continue on the current track. We're able to open the building up, and then on the 16th, we could have, with or without, um, Phase two, like you said, you could have people in the hallway. We'll already have our social distancing uh, decals on the floor. Perhaps we could stage folks and bring them in. So we can certainly look at doing that. I, I appreciate that, Mr. Stanley. Anything we can do to allow uh, our constituents to come in and speak to us directly, I think is a positive step in the right direction. 
Does the board have any additional questions or concerns for the staff? If not, this public hearing is now open. Emily, uh, has anyone uh, made you aware that they wanted to speak or you need to read anything? I haven't received any comments via email or through the YouTube live stream. Okay. If there isn't anyone that would like to speak in the audience, this would be final call. The public hearing is now closed. What is the pleasure of the board? Somebody is uh, not on mute and they need to mute their phone. I'm getting um, lots of static in, on this end. Okay, I think that was corrected. Thanks. We need a motion. Um, Mr. Chairman, show this motion that we have, can we just add 60 days to that, and would that be acceptable as a motion, or would you like to? Actually, leave it the way it is, because it references the six months. Okay, so it's correct. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Board of Supervisors adopt the proposed ordinance assuring continuity in the government of Thorne County, Virginia. Is there a second? I'll second it. Emily, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. Carter? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Mayor? Aye. Next item on the, on the agenda is the Shenandoah Farms uh, Sanitary District proposed 2020-2021 Capital Improvement Plan by Mr. Childers. Mr. Childers? Good evening, Chairman May, members of the board. Uh, on July 1st, 2010, through mutual agreement with the property owners of Shuttle Farm for the POSS board, the County of Warren assumed maintenance responsibilities for the approximately 42 mile road system and the two dams within the sanitary district. Soon afterwards, the county initiated a comprehensive road drainage study of the entire road system to inspect and evaluate the current infrastructure. Such a study was needed in order to help determine where deficiencies are and to provide valuable resource information such as traffic counts, drainage calculations, or needed improvements. After much public input, the final road and drainage study was approved by the Board of Supervisors in October of 2012. With the approval of the road and drainage study, one of the primary goals was to establish an official capital improvement plan, or CIP, to help guide infrastructure improvements and upgrades throughout the district. The CIP serves as a roadmap for the future to maintain focus on where improvements should be made and to ensure the limited Shuttle Farm Sanitary District funds are spent as wisely as possible. The first CIP was developed and adopted in the spring of 2013. After carefully considering the road and drainage study's findings, the public's input, traffic patterns, counts, and the history of ongoing problem maintenance areas, and the desires and direction of the current and previous POSF boards. Furthermore, we kept in mind a few simple goals when developing that initial plan. First, we wanted to address any safety issues and our hazards as soon as possible. Second, try to leverage as much funding, primarily through VDOT's revenue sharing program, as possible to upgrade the roadways in order to turn them over to the state of Virginia for maintenance. This should ultimately reduce the number of roadway miles we maintain and thus impacts to the maintenance budget. Third, we attempted to focus improvements on higher volume roadways and more densely populated areas so that as many residents as possible within the district would see benefits. And fourth, we wanted to address ongoing maintenance problem areas where routine maintenance replacement efforts simply were not addressing the issues. In order to assist us in the achievement of these goals, we established a long-term focused approach to the upgrading of the roadways to turn over to VDOT. This includes a prioritized list of network roads which includes some of the most heavily traveled roadways with ongoing maintenance issues that would benefit the most residents. Having a network, network of roadways in place today gives us something to work toward in years to come. The 
CIP is reviewed and updated annually to ensure it's current and meets the needs of the Shuttle Farms community. This past year, we were successful in completing the Tomahawk Way Phase II Rural Addition and Revenue Sharing Project and other internally funded projects. These completed projects have been removed from the draft plan and new priority projects added. The draft physical 2020-21 CIP was presented to the PSF board earlier this year for input and consideration. We've utilize the POSF board as an advisory group throughout the development and revision process. On January 23rd, the POSF board took official action to recommend approval of the draft CIP which you have in front of you. A copy of the proposed CIP, as I mentioned, is included in your packet. It contains a total of 20 projects with a total estimated cost of $7,375,668. Of those 20 projects, there are 10 proposed rural addition projects, which is proposed would be funded jointly through VDOT's revenue sharing program at 50%, the county's rural addition program at 25%, and the sanitary district budget, the remaining 25%. The 10 other internal projects would be funded entirely through the sanitary district budget or other revenue sources. The CIP as presented is not fully funded. However, at present, we currently have approximately $546,751 set aside in special project fund balances and reserve. An additional $53,000 is in current physical year budget line items and other projected revenues can be applied to the current and future CIP projects. I'll very briefly go over the list of, uh, of the projects contained in the plan. The first 10 are the rural addition VDOT revenue sharing projects I mentioned, and these are in priority order as they appear in the plan. The number one priority is Old Oak Lane Phase 4, that's a .44 mile long project. Number two is Young's Drive Phase 2. That's a 0.7 mile long project. Third priority is Old Oak Lane Phase 5. That's a 0.57 mile long project. Priority four is Lake Drive Phase 1. That's a 0.29 mile long project. Priority five is Tulip Poplar Drive Phase 1. That's a 0.19 mile long project. Priority 6 is Western Lane, Phase 2, that's a .58 mile long project. Priority 7, 8, and 9 are all on Venus Branch Road, and that's Phase 1, 2, and 3 uh, of that roadway corridor, which would complete it from the intersection of Old Oak up to Drummer Hill. And the 10th rural addition revenue sharing project would be Thompson's Mill Road, Phase 1, that's a relatively short project, it's only a tenth of a mile long, but the primary purpose of that is to install a box culvert or bridge over uh, the Venus Branch stream. Those ten rural addition revenue, pro revenue sharing projects uh, total 4.39 miles, which uh, once funded, completed, and turned over to VDOT would be, again, a little over four miles we would no longer have to maintain in the sanitary district. The other projects, uh, again, are totally funded through the Shuttle Farm Sanitary District budget. No uh, VDOT or county funds would uh, be included with their design or implementation. Again, in priority order, number one is Heavens Tree Road to improve and pave that roadway intersection with Howellsville Road. Number two is Lake Drive Phase 2, that's to upgrade and pave a .15 mile section of the roadway. We would basically build it to a VDOT Rural Edition standards, however, due to the steepness um, of grade, it wouldn't qualify to be added to the VDOT system. Priority three is Spring Road, uh, construct a cul-de-sac at the end of that roadway where none currently exists. Priority four is Huck Finn Drive, phase one. That's a Rural Edition project. It's approximately .07 mile long. That is a uh, project that uh, is eligible uh, to turn over to VDOT. However, the um, Shuttle Farms um, and POSF board has elected to construct that um, ourselves through the sanitary district budget with no VDOT or county funds 
associated, so they would pay 100% of that cost for that rural addition to be turned over to VDOT. Uh, number five are um, several cluster mailboxes. Uh, if you've been down there, been down there, you know there's several locations where there's uh, cluster mailboxes with hundreds of individual boxes and uh, the turnouts or access to those take a beating, so they need to be improved and paved. Uh, number six is uh, the old Linden Road community parking lot. Uh, that's to provide some um, uh, parking opportunities for folks in the, in the mountain heights, or excuse me, uh, yes, uh, area to, uh, during inclement weather. Uh, the seventh priority is Gurry Lane to construct a cul-de-sac at the south end of that roadway. Eight is a guardrail safety improvement project throughout the district. While none is currently identified, it's been a project uh, included in the plan since the implementation back in 2013 in case we do uh, locate a um, need. We do have an item for guardrail set up. Number nine is to improve some road surfaces on some extremely sharp and uh, narrow curves on the Drummer Hill, Reed, and Sharon Mountain. And ten is uh, uh, the ability to clear, drain, and stabilize some undeveloped right-of-ways. There's a number of those up in Shenandoah Farms that were never developed when the subdivision was put in. However, there are private properties on them, so if uh, an individual property owner would uh, seek to build a house on their property, we would have to go in and clear the right-of-way and at least stabilize it so they could get access. So that's a quick summary of the 20 projects. Um, the public hearing has been properly advertised, and I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Mr. Chairman, I would have one, uh, yes. or maybe a couple, but how, how are the, the, the residents informed of what's, what's happening? Is there letters, letters going out through the, uh, through the Homeowners Association? or Tell me what the process is that the, the people are being informed of what's happening. Well, the, the POSF, well, certainly COVID-19 has put a damper on their ability to meet, but right. typically the POSF board meets twice a month. Uh, they put that out on their website um, at the beginning of the year, their schedule. They post it on their uh, community bulletin boards. Uh, they don't and have not traditionally sent out individual letters uh, to the property owners. Uh, now... Here in the last couple of months, when we were going through the uh, budget process, uh, they made a concerted effort to do more than they normally have done in the past. They and that included got, that included letters. Yes, yes. During during that time, they did send a letter out, and they had an online survey that you could take. But that was concerning the uh, the budget. budget. But the the purpose of the tax increase in that sanitary district was to fund a number of the projects in the CIP that we're presenting this evening. Bob, on the county VDOT projects, mm -hmm. item, priorities one, two, three were already, funds were set aside for those, is that correct? Portion mm -hmm. of the funds, Portion yes. Of the, and Portion and of so it's four, five, six were the ones that we were talking about during the budget discussion. Yes. Priorities four, five, and six. Okay. Yes. Okay. Lake Drive, Tula Poplar Drive, and uh, Western Lane. Okay. How much is Warren County's 25% coverage of this? Of the total plan? I know you said the total for, I'm assuming that's all 20 projects is $7 million? Yes, that's all 20 projects. And... So we're talking about four, five, and six are the projects to get started out of that 20 in the next year, hopefully. Is that what the plan is? And it won't be the next year, ma'am. We won't know until the next a month or two whether or not we even receive uh, approval from VDOT okay. on priority four, five, and six. And if we are successful, it might be spread over a two-year period. So one or two of them may be funded next physical year and the third one the following physical so year. you're probably it's talking 22, 23? Yes, that, yes. Okay. Yeah, do, you, do you have an estimate of what what the 25% that we would have to come up with in that 
time period? Well, uh, let me see. Yes, I don't have that exact number off the top of my head, but I can get you very close. I can get you very close. Um, the Shenandoah Farms share of the projects are approximately four hundred ninety-five thousand dollars. So oh, ours me, would those three ours projects. would be your equipment. So you all ours, ours, ours would be very close to that. So four hundred ninety-three to ninety-five. We've been budgeting we, about two hundred fifty thousand a year for the county, so it would take about two years of our funding to cover five hundred thousand. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Are any of these roads into Clark County? No, none of these. None of these are all additions. And when we build them and get them up to VDOT, VDOT, because of the short spans of them, the sanitary districts, public works and the sanitary district still maintains them during snow removal. Yeah, we have a contract. And VDOT reimburses for that? That's correct. Okay. And the thought process behind that has been in order for VDOT to accept a road, it has to tie into an existing mm -hmm. VDOT road. So we, General Farms personnel and Public Works personnel, are typically up in the subdivision before VDOT gets out to that point. So we had to travel over those sections of road we'd upgraded and turned over to VDOT. So we were there already. It just made sense. Uh, here approximately five years or so ago, I started talking with VDOT about uh, entering into a snow removal contract with them. We're already there. We got the plows on the truck. We might as well plow them open to get to the other sanitary district roads and get paid for it while we're there. Okay, so they do that for snow removal. Um, wear and tear and resurfacing, do they pay and do that themselves, or is that subcontracted back down to the sanitary district? No, no, they, they do. You're talking about wear and tear of the pavement, the right. shoulder. They, VDOT takes care of that itself. We don't, uh, we don't do any other what we would call ordinary or routine maintenance on those roads. Now, if, the, if we're if there's a tree falls across the road or something, and we're there, we'll cut it out of the road to get it out of the road so you know, traffic can get through. But routine maintenance, no, VDOT still takes care of all that. Does the board have any additional questions or concerns? The, the, the snow removal, is that, uh, is that a fire rate that, uh, that, that, that the state is paying for? Oh, yes. Um, yes, sir. Okay. So it, it covers the entire expense of? The truck, the man, the fuel, yes, the operator. It's a, it's a very good rate. Okay. Additional questions or concerns? I, I guess I just have... Once uh, I'm familiar with that Lake Drive, and it's the main one of the main entrances, it's rather steep. Mm -hmm. But I notice it's way down on number four list. Is that that being the main entrance? Is it not used that much, or no? It's it's as critically important as those other ones, Mr. Fox. It was just a matter of working with the the POSF board, the advisory group. Uh, do they the ones that kind of suggest? Yes. This? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that that answers that question. Yeah. Yeah, they're choosing their own roads that they want to take care of. Yeah. And like you all, I'll give them feedback to questions they have on maintenance issues or safety issues, and they set the priorities, basically. And, and the drainage study, is that still being used? I noticed we said something about some drainage. Is, they, is that the drainage study still being used? The way There's hardly a week goes by. I don't refer to that. Okay. Sometimes sure. daily. Very good. Okay. It's worth uh, it worth its weight in gold, to tell you the honest truth. I know it's, it's costly up front, but... Yeah. Does the board have any additional questions or concerns? Um, Tony or um, Dolores? Yes, sir. If not, the public hearing. Thank you. If not, the public hearing is now open. Emily, is anyone signed up, or do you have anything to read? Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. So I received four emails, uh, three emails and one phone call prior to the meeting. And I've also received a public comment through the YouTube live stream, so I'll go ahead and read those for you now. Uh, the first is from Mr. Ralph Rinaldi. He sent two separate emails, one in his, his capacity as chairman of the POSF board and one in, in his capacity as a resident. The board of directors of POSF fully supports the 2020-2021 capital improvement plan for Shenandoah Farm Sanitary District. We believe the capital improvement plan provides a blueprint for the continued improvements in the farms. We also fully support the efforts of our manager, Mr. Robert Childress. His guidance over the years has been a big part of the farm's improvements. The plan has improvements for all areas of the community. Everyone receives the benefits of this plan. Without a plan, we can't move forward. Thank you. Next was a phone call from Mr. Larry Cox. He's a resident and property owner of 557 Lake Drive. He said that he has lived there since 1984 and he is in support of the proposed capital improvement plan for the Shenandoah Farm Sanitary District. Next is Mr. Bruce Boyle of 343 Susan's Court. I am in support of the Shenandoah Farm Sanitary District Capital Improvement Program as written. We are in the midst of a longer journey towards paving the roads here in the Sanitary District through our participation in the Rural Roads Edition Program sponsored by the Commonwealth of Virginia. I hope to see our roads paved through this cost-effective program, and this capital improvement plan is the best foot forward in this direction as the CIP was worked cooperatively with county staff and the board of directors of the property owners of Shenandoah Farms. This is a positive step in the continuing development of the farms. Thank you for staying the course. Next is Mr. Patrick Skelly of 88 Mosby Meadow Lane. I have owned property in the farms since the early 70s. To say that the farm's infrastructure has vastly improved since the formation of the sanitary district would be a gross understatement, which is why I would like to express my support for the capital improvement program being currently put forth for the continued improvement of our community. And then Ms. Linda McDonough submitted a comment to the YouTube live stream. The POSF advisory board does not speak for me. I vote no to anything that the advisory board wants. Old Oak Lane has a gas line that's under the road. You can't even pave it. All this money to bring our mountain roads up to VDOT standards, it's a waste of our tax money. And those are all the comments I received. And could you repeat the name of that, that last one? Ms. Linda McDonough. Okay. Thank you. And those are all the comments I've received, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. If there is no one else that would like to speak, um, consider this the final call. Oh, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. There are a few more that have come in while I've been speaking. Okay. We have... Uh, oh, Ms. McDonough continued, uh, this is wrong. I didn't know you were shoving this down our throats. You heard how many miles of roads. And then Mr. Messenger says, with the county's board approval of increasing the sanitary district fee to 350 per year, I took this as an indication the county is willing to continue to do their part moving forward with the capital improvement plan. Okay. Um, would you do me a favor and read Linda's comment fully from start to finish so we can hear all of it? Uh, yes. The POSF Inc. Advisory Board does not speak for me. I vote no to anything that the advisory board wants. Old Oak Lane has the gas line that's under the road. You can't pave it. Are you hearing this? All this money to bring our mountain roads up to VDOT standards. It is a waste of our taxpayer money. This is wrong. I didn't know you were shoving this down our throats. You all heard how many miles of roads. Yes, most that agree are on the POSF Inc. board, which I also in your packets included the survey results, which shows that over 80% of the respondents agree. But that was her comments in their entirety. Okay, thank you. If there is no one else in the audience that would like to speak, final call again. Emily, see anything new? Just somebody who said hello. <laughs> no, hello. Idea, no idea who they are, but hello. Okay, thank you. This public hearing is now closed. What is the pleasure of the board? Sharon, I move that the Board of Supervisors approve the proposed four year 2020 to 21 Shenandoah Farm Sanitary District Capital Improvement Plan as presented. Do I have a second? Do I have a second from anyone? Ms. Tony, I second it. Although, uh, roll, roll call, sir. Uh, roll call, please, Emily. Mr. Carter? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Colors? No. Mr. Maine? 
Aye. Item number four is um, the next thing on the agenda. Uh, it is the ordinance to vacate the existing 50-foot wide platted right-of-way on Pawnee Place in Section 7A of Thunderbird Ranch Subdivision. Uh, to Mrs. Logan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Planning Department has received a request to vacate a 50-foot wide platted right-of-way identified as Pawnee Place as recorded in deep of 171 on page 496. The right-of-way area is shown on a recent plat prepared by Colson PLC, which was included in your packet. Pawnee Place is platted between lots owned by the applicant, um, identified on tax map number 26A, section A is lot 30 through 34. The um, owner of the surrounding platted lots is a platted right-of-way, Ms. Carla Cook is requesting um, for the right of way to be vacated in order for her to combine all of the lots to assemble a building lot for her home well and septic. The access does not lead to any other lots and does not hinder current or future access to any lots as long as um, the lots 30 through 34 that she owns are consolidated with the vacation as is shown on the plat, which I've included that in the motion. Um, I've also attached a proposed um, ordinance to vacate, and there's um, copies of maps in your packet as well. And the public hearing has been properly advertised. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, Thunderbird Ranch actually does not have a homeowners association, so um, there was no one who I could contact for that. But um, this isn't an actual road. Um, it's just platted, and then it kind of has grown up with grass in the dri little driveway area. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Does the board have any questions or concerns? If not, the public hearing is now open. Emily, has anyone signed up? No one has submitted comments to me, and no one has commented on the YouTube live stream. Thank you. Unless there's anyone that wants to speak up now, consider this the final call. This public hearing is now closed. Uh, what is the pleasure of the board? Well, it would have been nice to have heard from some of the residents uh, in their subdivision. Yes, it would have. Uh, if not being any comments, I'll make a motion. I move that the Board of Supervisors vacate the 50-foot platted right away shown as as Pawnee's place as recorded in deed book 171 on page 496 in the Thunderbird Ranch subdivision pursuant to section 15.2-2272 15, 15 of the Code of Virginia to be replaced with a private excess easement. Such approval is consensus on lots 30 and 34 being consolidated as shown on the Colson Land Survey and Platt dated March 11, 2020. And I think that would be 30 through 34. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Uh, Chairman, real quick. I, one, I think, you know, from the neighborhood standpoint, you're getting rid of a number of potential houses. So I think the net impact on the rest of the neighborhood is less traffic. So I think there's, a, there's an advantage for the rest of the neighborhood uh, by consolidating those lots. And it doesn't appear that it's going to impact anyone other than what's being showed on the plan. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Emily, could I get a roll call, please? Mr. May? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Carter? Aye. Thank you. Now we should be able to go back to our regular, regular meetings. Um, can we get the report from the COVID-19 um, expenditures for Warren County, which is Taryn Logan? Um, yes, sir. As I mentioned um, in my last report earlier this month, the planning department is tasked with the collection and submittal of the county's COVID-19 related expenditures for federal reimbursement 
Each department has been continuing to track um, their expenses and providing information to our department to coordinate and submit. For now, um, we have an estimated total, this is really through about the beginning of May or by the second week, um, of $103,179.79. Um, that has been spent towards the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I have attached tables um, to my memo. This is the spreadsheet that I use um, to put the different expenses into the cost categories that FEMA requires um, them to be in. So I just printed you all out um, sections of that spreadsheet that show each individual expenditure of each department, and then it has a breakdown of the total amount spent by each department thus far. Um, a lot of it has been grouped into materials and supplies. Um, some of that will be separated out because some of the materials and supplies are actually to disinfect public facilities, so I'll, I'll probably include them in that category for FEMA. Um, but it's really working with BDEM to just, you know, make sure I have everything in the right cost categories. But hopefully this gives you more detail. Um, if you want any anything else, I'm happy to provide it. But that's where we are um, currently. Are you getting... And I have information being submitted really week, almost daily to my department. Just when, when departments are getting, you know, ex different expenditures, um, they're sending them over, so... Are you getting them as quickly as you would like, or are you having are you having to ask for them, or do we need to help you in any way to collect data? No, I've been getting um, you know the information from the departments. That I've, we've been in good, I've been in good communications with the different departments, so um, I'm getting everything we need. Some things are triple, you know, trickling in later, like the credit card statements that need to be attached. Um, copies of checks, um, but just but the initial receipts and um, FEMA cover sheets and um, time sheets, the department has been great giving giving me that information. So I think this this number is pretty accurate on um, what's been spent so far. We're, we still need to update some labor um, for overtime, and I just received. The latest bill for the um, daycare center, so that hasn't been added yet, and that was a little over six thousand, but that I just received, so so it's pretty updated. But departments have been great getting me the information. So I'm think I think look at that. Have you had um, any luck with getting any of it back, or is it just too too soon to be asking for that? Oh, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Have you, have you received any funds from them, or is it just too soon to be asking that question? Well, it's from FEMA? Yes, yeah, from, from a, re re a reinvestment to, back to us. Well, we're just starting to submit to them, having getting the packages together um, to submit to VDEM and then to FEMA. So... We, we haven't received any money back yet. Yeah, I didn't know how long it would take. Rick just walked in the door. Maybe he's got an update. That, uh, the you FEMA, probably can contribute to that. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the FEMA reimbursement part will take uh, quite some time. I mean, it could be six months to a year before we actually put in for it. Uh, we have to do v, uh, VDM first, and then we put in for FEMA, and then we wait. So that all of the... Right now, the one of the three parents talking about, it could be a year, year and a half, two, before we see it come back. Okay. All right, I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. The reports. Mr. Uh, Carter, do you have anything to tell us today? Yeah, I mean, some of it going on, I guess, you know, we had a limited opening, or I guess, was it phase one? 
So hopefully that's starting to loosen things up and people will, will um, start supporting the businesses, getting out, and hopefully get uh, some of their jobs back. And also in, in, in uh, continuing in the vein of uh, no donuts, shoot. Good to bring you all popcorn tonight. Um, from uh, um, Rick Novak of World Theater, or World Cinemas, I'm sorry. I forgot all about that. Sorry about that. But yeah, he's, he's, doing, he's one of those people out there trying to be innovative and, and offering popcorn um, um, pickup. And then I also contacted Beth Waller again um, to kind of put in the spotlight some other good things going on. Emily, do you have that available? I do. Give me one moment. Okay. Well, she put together a little blurb and then, um, again, like I said, spotlight some other people out there that are you know, doing some good things. Can everybody see my screen? I'm going to take those yes. Hi, this is Beth with What Matters Warren. It's been my hobby for years to shine a light on the amazing things that are happening in this community and the world. And during this crisis, I have been flabbergasted at the amazing and just heartwarming things that, that people, leaders, and, and the community members are doing here to give back and to make a difference, to transition their businesses, to be able to survive and actually thrive during this crisis. So I'm going to introduce you to Mitchell, who's going to introduce you to some of the folks that we've been featuring in our videos and encourage anybody to reach out to us if you'd like to be featured, if you see something that's going on in the community that you think people need to know about, please, let's spread the word about the amazing things happening right here in Front Royal and Warren County. We will get through this together. Thank you so much, Beth. Uh, we've just been so encouraged by how some of the community members are giving back and local businesses and things like that. I want to introduce you to George McIntyre, who, uh, if you don't know George, you certainly know the Apple House uh, and their amazing donuts over there. They found such an awesome way to give back, uh, not only locally, but they've been shipping donuts all across America. So here's George telling you about uh, what they've been doing there with their donuts. Hi, I'm Katie Tool with the Apple House. And I'm George McIntyre with the Apple House. One of the one of the biggest things that we do, because this is a family down here, and we are all together on all these these projects and, and talks and good things. And we really do love the community and we are looking now at how we what we can do to bring things back to life as we know it and uh, share the good work. So one project that we started is we recently started shipping donuts, and today we will be finishing shipping over 200 dozen donuts all over the world, including Hawaii and Alaska, Florida, and all over. But more than that, we also wanted to keep it in our community. So we have given to our local police station, sheriff's department, emergency room, nurses and such, because we feel like it's important to keep um, giving to those people that constantly give to us. With kids being out of school, the Parks and Recreation Department has stepped up to the plate. Robin with the local Parks and Rec Department is creating these boxes with a team of volunteers that are going out to families across Front Royal and Warren County full of fun family activities that will bring families together uh, during this COVID crisis. Hello, Front Royal Warren County. I'm Robin Richardson, the Assistant Director here at Warren County Parks and Rec. And I would like to share with you a great opportunity that we've come up with. And we brainstormed a little bit with uh, my staff and we came up with these wonderful recreation activities in a box. They're called Stay Home and Stay Active. So basically what it is, is every week you sign up and then when you come pick up a box. Um, you'll have an indoor and outdoor activity, a science or creative activity, a virtual road trip that you can go on with your family, and then you have a family night on Friday. And last but not least is a local alterations business. Millie from Alterations by Millie has been making masks and keeping her team employed by having this opportunity that she's using to sew back into the community. Here's Millie telling you about what she's been doing. Hi, I'm Millie Andrews with Alterations by Millie. We are making masks for the community as a way of keeping you safe and others safe from you. You get to see the fabric board 
and you just message us and say, oh, I want a number eight, a number two, and maybe a number 34. And we ask you if you want ear loops or head elastic, and it is keeping us busy and afloat because all the proms and weddings have been canceled, and that is what my business is about. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate that. Did it come out okay? Because I got a lot of feedback. Yeah, it did. But I'm trying to listen to it. I've seen it, but hopefully it worked out well. But yeah, so, you know, those are just a couple examples. There's plenty more. Uh, the only last thing I'd like to add, too, is um, <clears throat> Monday, I believe, is uh, Memorial Day, which will be a holiday for uh, everybody. And it's also, it's usually. That's when uh, there's a lot of gatherings with picnics and family and friends. And again, like I said, it's like the unofficial opening of summer. So hopefully everybody enjoys it and uh, still uh, take, takes uh, precautions to be safe. And again, thank you, sir, for the time. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Uh, Mr. Fox, do you have anything today? I have nothing, sir. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Mrs. Colors? I'm just doing my regular watchdogging for the community, um, checking on things and trying to keep myself in a learning mode of what it is to be a supervisor and representing my South River District. Just want to wish everyone a safe, healthy, and happy holiday weekend. And um, that's all I have. This is, uh, Mrs. Oates, do you have anything for us today? Um, yes. Mr. Chairman, um, on last Monday, I attended Samuel's Library Board of Trustees meeting. It was also in a Zoom uh, online meeting. Uh, the library is adapting um, to the COVID environment and continuing to serve their customers in creative and wonderful ways. They're, um, they even have some of their librarians reading to students on Facebook Live. Um, so it's been a, a time for creativity. And my family and I have been ordering takeout as often as we can uh, to support our local, locally owned restaurants. And we've been very impressed with the, the delivery services um, and the curbside pickup. Uh, it's been a real positive experience and everybody seems to just want to work together. And um, I also had on my list a shout out to Parks and Rec. Um, Robin Richardson was making pizzas on Facebook Live, and um, that was one of the take-home kits this week, and I thought it was really uh, a great way to reach out to the community, especially to the children who feel isolated at home right now. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mrs. Um, I was lucky enough to um, help DSS a little bit with some deliveries. Um, we got some additional food that came into the facility there we got it unloaded and got it shipped out um, on Thursday I had the emergency um, roundtable which we had the press conference that was um, that was done well and it uh, re was received real well as well um, we also had the um, uh, briefing in the morning that went good it shows the continued improvement uh, we see numbers every day, and we always get reported every day. Um, I had six visits to um, citizens out in the public, so I haven't stopped going to whoever wants me to come out to visit. Uh, we did vi visit the Victory Garden, which was on Saturday, uh, and uh, I delivered about 20 boxes of food to people that were hungry. So I had a good week, and... Um, that's all that I have as well. Mr. Stanley? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, first, a coronavirus update. Uh, county staff continue to monitor the situation and take the necessary precautions. As you're aware, earlier this month, Governor Northam issued Executive Order Number 61, which begins Virginia's path forward to reopening. This order um, addresses and eases some of the restrictions previously imposed. To begin our own transition here in Warren County, we're going to begin with bringing staff back into the offices of normal business hours. 
County offices remain closed to the public, but all departments from the purview of the County Administrator have resumed normal on-site scheduling of employees effective May 18, subject to appropriate social distancing and in accordance with the provisions of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Accommodations may be made for COVID vulnerable employees. It's our plan to have a soft reopen at the Government Center beginning Tuesday, May 26, for the Treasurer and Commissioner of the Revenue Offices only. Additional safety precautions and social distancing measures will be in place for the soft reopening. Other offices will remain closed to the public until at least June 8th. And please keep in mind, June 8th date is a, is a target date uh, that's been tentatively set. We'll be coordinated with the implementation of the Governor's Phase 2 Virginia's path forward. Additionally, school system continues food distribution to students throughout the county, thanks to Sue Ann and the school staff and school board for supporting that endeavor. Social Services is partnering with CCAP, distributing food twice a week from the 15th Street Complex. Social Services is partnering with the Thermal Shelter, hosting and feeding guests seven nights a week at the Health and Human Services Complex. And the school system continues to provide emergency child care <coughs> for essential personnel. Also, thank the town, they're maintaining their COVID-19 helpline. Parks and Recreation, in support of the Governor's Ford Virginia Phase 1 plan, Parks and Rec reopened portions of outdoor facilities for group exercise on May 15, subject to the following. Use of outdoor facilities is at their own risk. Persons in a high-risk group as determined by the CDC, which includes persons over age 65 or anyone regardless of age who has a significant medical condition, including but not limited to asthma, it is not recommended that you use outdoor recreational facilities other than the walking trails. By order of the governor, groups of more than 10 are prohibited. So we do have folks that are gathering using our shelters. Um, we encourage them, please, to keep it under the 10. And please practice social distancing and be safe, again, during the pandemic. Um, additional parks and rec facilities will reopen in accordance with the governor's sequence uh, guidance. Playgrounds, picnic shelters, trails, skate park, and open spaces um, are open to the general public with the new signs posted. All park system restrooms remain locked and closed with signs posted, but we have portable restrooms available for use, and they're cleaned several times a week by the contractor. Uh, parks and rec tennis courts remain open for singles play only with social distancing required, and basketball courts remain closed at this time. Hopefully we'll be able to open those up with phase two. Uh, we continue to encourage citizens and staff to practice preventative measures. Frequently wash your hands, don't touch your face, and wear a face cloth covering in public settings where other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain, grocery stores, pharmacies, and such. These three things alone will slow the spread of the virus and reduce personal risk of infection. If you're a person under investigation or a PUI or a confirmed COVID-19 patient, please respect the quarantine instructions from your physician for both you and your entire household. And if you need assistance, reach out to your neighbors, friends, church members. This is a great opportunity for all of us to come together as a community and support each other through the crisis. Support local businesses as much as possible. This could make the difference between the business surviving the crisis or having to close permanently. Go out, buy gift cards, even if you can't go to the movie theater or the bowling alley or facilities like that. Support them any way you can. We're all in this for the long haul. Expect the effects of the virus to last through the summer and into the fall. And I want to again thank Rick Farrell, Chief Maybe, uh, the chairman, uh, who heads up our emergency committee and all members, our emergency response team for their preparation efforts and the effort they're putting in on a daily basis. Coronavirus employee recognition. Uh, we have a number of employees, and you saw one tonight uh, with Robin online, but we've got a a number of employees that are going above and beyond the call of duty. These employees are helping to make sure the county is prepared to meet the challenge of facing, facing all of us and ensuring that essential services are being provided. Some are more visible than others. Uh, this week I want to take an opportunity to, to recognize uh, Travis Jones, Public Works Foreman. Travis has been working independently for several months uh, due to an unfortunate injury to another member of staff. And during this time, Travis has maintained sanitary district roads responded to weather events, cleared down trees, and performed additional tasks for other departments uh, whenever needed or requested. 
He is focused on ensuring E911 signage is installed or repaired quickly during the pandemic, realizing that it can be a, uh, critical for emergency responders and important for many who are currently relying on home delivery services. With a positive attitude, Travis works hard for Warren County each day. Thank you, Travis, for your hard work and dedication. Corona's vulnerable revenue, uh, as previously stated to the board, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on those revenue categories that we anticipate being impacted by all the closures. I'm pleased to report that for the month of March, the county's share of local sales tax revenue was $400,198.23. This amount is up 10% over the three sixty two four hundred seventy two collected in March of 2019. In the coming week, we'll see what the impact is on meals and lodging tax collection for the month of April. And, um, and next month, we'll see what the sales tax impact was for April with the first full month of the impact. Development Review Committee uh, met virtually on April 22nd. The committee discussed projects in the county, including uh, the county is processing three new short-term tourist rental conditional use permits, uh, the multi-tenant building at River and Commons. Um, demo was complete, and they've actually are in the process now of uh, finishing the foundation and have had plumbing inspections for the foundation. And the site plan for the Eccles Warehouse facility has been uh, resubmitted to the planning department and sent out to agencies for comment. The committee also discussed town projects, including update on the sheet site project. If you haven't been by in the last couple of weeks, the building's up, the canopy is up, and things are moving pretty quickly. Harbor Freight is proposing to move in the former Big Lot space. Now the Big Lots has moved in the former Food Lion space. So it's good to see uh, some tenancy there at the shopping center. And the former bank there at the Gateway Plaza is in the planning stage to be converted to a drive through restaurant business. Um, committee will meet again on May 25th, and I believe they'll be meeting virtually at least again for another month. Uh, tourism Committee, we had uh, an, obviously an update uh, from Ms. Barnhart, Vice Chair of the Committee, tonight on their options for moving forward with tourism in the community. We want to thank her and the rest of the committee for their efforts in putting it together. Uh, the Community Wayfinding Science Program is in a final stage of receiving VDOT approval. Planning staff will be presenting to VDOT at their virtual Wayfinding Science kickoff meeting within the next couple of weeks. And all permits have been approved for the county to place the Love Work sign at the intersection of Guard Hill Road, Route 345-22, and we hope to be ready to get started on that. Remote Fire Station, uh, after our work session last week, we've got some direction and been uh, moving forward with that project again. Uh, project's approximately 62% complete based on billing through March. Uh, still expect to be completed by fall of 2020. Um, as far as other commercial projects and, and uh, in-house county projects, uh, not a whole lot to report. We are we did have a, um, a site visit out at Morgan Ford Bridge, and uh, hopefully we'll have some plans. And I know we talked about having a public hearing on that project um, later this summer as, once we've been able to pull that together. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Any questions or concern from the from the board? Thank you, Mr. Stanley. Mr. Ham, do you have anything for us? You're on mute, sir. Actually, it looks like he's unmuted. Nope. Hey, Emily. Yep. Jason's unmuted, but we're not hearing him. Can y'all hear us? They can't hear us. Or we can't hear them. Ms. Oates, can you unmute your microphone and speak to see if we can hear you? Hmm. Hello? We can hear her just fine. I think it's yeah. on Jason's end. Let's try you, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> hey, screw a little bit. Yes, <laughs> Wait, hold it back up again, Jason. I couldn't read it. Hold it back up. Can you hold that back up, Jason? No, you can't. Please? No? Okay. <laughs> maybe tell, tell hold the paper back. back up. Maybe, maybe you want to sign out and come back in. and only make that works. Technical difficulties. He's frozen now. There he is. I just told him to 
we'll sign, I'll sign back in, Emily, so let's see if we'll do Okay. That. Do you know if he can hear us, or can he just not talk to us? Jason, can you hear us? Yes, no? no. He, yeah, no, he's yeah, not responding he's at all. Signing okay. Out. All right. So I'll go let him back in. All right. <laughs> let's give him a minute to get back on. One way to silence that. Oh, we're going to take a break, Mr. Time. Chairman. <laughs> While we're waiting on him, why don't we take a five-minute break? Is that good, Dolores? Tony, take a five-minute break. Mr. Stanley stepped away. For, oh, he's getting some coffee there. Um, Mr. Ham, are you ready for us? There we go. I do not have a report. The note said no report, and I apologize for the miscommunication. It was not. It was not on mute, so I don't know quite what happened. But uh, I should have texted Doug no report, but I wasn't thinking. Technical difficulties. They're wonderful things. Yeah. Okay. Next thing on our agenda is the approval of the, the minutes for um, the work session on February 11th, 2020. Is there a motion? Well, let's, let's speak. I think it's speaker's minutes. Yeah, it's speaker's minutes. Jason, we can still hear you. We can still okay, hear sorry. you. Sorry. <laughs> Do we have a, a motion? I'll move to accept the minutes as written. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? Emily, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. Carter? Mr. Carter? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. May? Aye. And some of the people who are in the YouTube live stream are having trouble hearing the board members here because our phone is down. So if you just speak louder. Thank you. Louder, okay. Next item on our agenda is to approve the minutes for the regular meeting on May 5th, 2020. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Emily, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. May? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Carter? Aye. Next on our agenda is the appropriations and transfers. Do we have a motion for that? Can I, may I interrupt for just one minute, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Did, did I hear Emily correctly that the phone is down? Yes, we had a power pop a little while ago, and we don't have phone service. We're still on YouTube Live and still have audio if we talk loud enough, Jason. Okay, so there isn't anything. I mean, having a five-minute recess to fiddle with something is not going to help us. No. No. No, okay. phones are down the whole building right now. Okay, well, we're doing what we can do. We're doing what we can do. Do we have a motion on the appropriations and transfers? Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the appropriations and transfers uh, as presented. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any further discussion? Emily, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. Carter? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. May? Aye. Next on our agenda is the approval of the accounts. Just 
like to make one note, if you will. I noticed the tax is collection more better now than the Pine, Pine Law Group, it appears. Yeah, I would say that um, both entities are kind of hindered right now because Mr. Palm was moving, had the court to establish a tax sale, and that's everything's on hold until we can at least be able to have, you know, 100 people standing right. in the room in here. So I suspect hopefully by the middle to end of summer, they'll be able to pick up and start actively working that okay. out there. Anyway. Is there a motion? I move that we accept approval of the counts as presented. Is there a second? I'll second it. Emily, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. Mink? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Carter? Aye. Mr. Chairman, I was wondering if Mr. Childers was going to be back around. He's still here. If you have a question for him. Uh, I'm coming up on uh, something on some minutes. Uh, on J, item number J, I was going to question. No, no, which, maybe, maybe you can answer. Which page? It's uh, page J6. Uh, and whenever the chairman calls for it. Remember what the date of the meeting was on there? Uh, it's page six. There's, there's a couple sets of oh, okay. There, so. It's the first one that I've got in the book here. Is it the one that begins at the top with hours a week to shadow the new CSA coordinator? Is that the page six that you're referring to? Yeah, yeah that's page six. I've got okay. it. And, and which, which oh, section? I can't hear what you guys are saying very well. Okay. Archie's looking for a specific section of the minutes, Ms. Oates. Okay. Right here was the one. And, and which minutes, Mr. Stanley? It looks like it's the first set in your packet, second page, set. or second set, page so six. So it's set number two, the budget work session of February the 11th, page number six. Okay. Okay. Un under the Shenandoah Farm Sanitary District section. Okay. Mr. Fox had a question for you, Mr. Childress. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, please. Uh, Mr. Childress, uh, I'm just noting here that the uh, Shenandoah it's on page six. Uh, the minutes the Shandor Farms Board had requested a forty-five dollars per improved lot, mm -hmm. and eighty-five per unimproved lot, which would yes. be used primarily for road capital. And that sounds like a, a good plan. Uh, but will there be a separate, uh, separate uh, accounting of the unimproved, uh, uh, the unimproved payments and the improved payments? And would it be designated for the unimproved to go specifically for capital improvement plan? Not on the tax bill, no, sir. That 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 move was to equalize the rate. That's why there was a difference. Yeah, to but go, but the higher know. rate is to actually be applied for unimproved roads to bring them up to. That's correct. That's, that's correct. correct. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. That, and, uh, and I was wondering if that's going to be kept separate rather than uh, uh, having un the money. For unimproved spent on, uh, I mean, money for unimproved runnings to be used for a regular, regular maintenance. No, all the, the, the bulk, the bulk of that tax increase went directly to the capital line items in this year's fiscal budget, whether it be revenue sharing or the internal road projects. In, in theory, that's up to each board each year. Y'all determine where that might. So, all that new revenue was shown in the capital line item doesn't mean the board next year couldn't change some but that was what that the, the, yeah. you know, kind of the understanding was but it's incumbent upon each board each year to uh, uh, leave that funding in that location okay yeah, that's, that's the only question I had then. Next item on uh, the unfinished business the, is the approval of the minutes for various budget work sessions um, and regular meetings. Uh, Emily, that was you. Yes, so Mrs. Oates had requested an amendment to one of the sets of minutes to include Mr. Carter's comments, and I went ahead and added that. Um, I also amended the beginning portion of our electronic meetings to reflect that they were, in fact, conducted electronically via Google Meet. And those are the amendments that I made, but all of the other sets of minutes are as presented. 
do um, Mr. Ham, do we need to do anything with that at all? What What are the? Is there some piece of paper there that reflects Mr. Carter's comments and the language that Emily just discussed? The, the piece of paper included is the set of minutes. So there is no cover sheet for this item. It's just the minutes. Okay. Well, the ones in my packet are, are different than the ones you're getting ready to approve. Is that true? So there should be several sets of minutes. So we're on, we're on item J right now. So we just approved both under G. So the ones under J are the ones that are the unfinished business. And the set of minutes in there, it's April the 21st. It's right under the agenda public comment period where Mr. Carter made the comment about not reading the comments in full for the April 14th meeting. That was the section that Mrs. Oates wanted me to add, and I've included that. Okay. And so do, do the board members have in, in front of them that yes. addition? Yes. Yes, we yes. do. You know, our, so our record will be clear what we're doing, and then also the other change that you stated with respect to um, the Google meet. Correct. Thank you. So, you know, approval of the minutes as amended uh, would be the motion. Okay. Do I have a, a motion, please? Do we have a motion from anyone? I move that we approve the minutes as amended. Is there a second? I'll second. Emily, could I get a roll call, please? Mr. Carter. Excuse me one second. No. Yes, sir. Um, and it's okay. We've had this come up before. I just noticed some of those minutes, and this is more for Jason, I guess. Some of the minutes that we've covered before. Anyway, some of the minutes, I wasn't there. I think uh, Mr. Fox wasn't there. But it's still okay for us to approve them? Yes. Okay. If you like, if you want to abstain, it would be reasonable. Uh, to right. do so. Um, if you want to approve them, you can. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Emily, could I get a roll call, please? Mr. Carter? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. May? Aye. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Yes, ma'am. Can we go back to the appropriations and transfers just for a second? Yes, ma'am. It was with a little reluctance. In, in the future, before we have change orders with the I'm fire sorry, department, sweetie. can you hear me? Oh, he's talking Spanish. Sorry. Can we have those change orders come to the board, if possible, or so that we're in the no beforehand instead of after? I would just say that how about I come to you guys as the building committee it's hard sometimes <clears throat> to wait two weeks to a board meet when they've got something that okay. needs to be done. Um, you know, the I have certain approval authority to a certain amount anyway, but certainly anything big. But we can come to the building committee if you guys are okay with that. And then if there's an issue there, we can bring it to the full board. But you know, I know from time to time that um, for timing's sake. Uh, it's necessary, maybe within a week, to make a decision and try to keep things moving. What is the amount that you can prove on your own without our consent? You, well, you I mean, you know, typically it's the 20K okay. plus, but, you know, uh, but it's the board, we've got a set amount of 5%, I believe, on the project. Mm -hmm. If we exceed that project, that's where we have to come back to the board for approval of the um, the project budget. So we have, we approve the the contract for the with the contractor and a contingency budget I believe of five percent, and if we get something go above that, we got to come back to the board and ask for more money because that's all the money that's been authorized right. for the project. Right. But certainly, um, yeah, we can come to you guys at that. Okay, I would appreciate that. Is that all that you need to speak on? Yes, sir. Thank you. New business and the consent agenda. The next item is the consent agenda. Are there any items that need to be pulled for further discussion? Just one, if you will. The Warren County Education Foundation scholarship. What kind of funding do we have? What kind of 
kind of funding is there? Do you have that? So, uh, I can, if you're okay, Mr. Chairman, yes, I'll address it real quick. So, originally, back in 1983, um, the foundation, and, th and that was, um, was the old VRS retirement for the folks that went to Mosby Academy. The teachers that went th there, there was a retirement fund, and that was uh, terminated their participation in the Virginia retirement system, the county requested the funds be used to establish a, a scholarship fund. And that original amount is $138,122.50. Um, since that time, we've been fundraising additional funds by sending out request letters, and people can donate. It's tax deductible if they write a uh, check, and a number of board members every year would make a contribution. But now the, the principal amount is $188,522.16 that's in that account. There's no tax dollars. It has nothing to do with county dollars per se. Right. It's the original VRS plus the amount donated to that. So the total amount currently available in the account is about 188000 But there's no county money involved? No, no sir. Run, it's not run, county money. Okay. It's a scholarship fund. Right. So, Mr. Stingley, why then is the Board of Supervisors um, involved in the, the transfer of the funds? So that's the way it was set up in 1983, um, is that the board became the steward of the money, uh, in essence. And there are a handful of other scholarship funds that are maintained by the treasurer. Uh, this one, the way it's worded, is that you guys have to approve the expenditure of those funds. Um, okay. That's the way it is. All right. So and it, and and you're currently just asking or uh, for three thousand dollars from the educational foundation at this point. That's correct. It, we used to give out two five thousand dollars scholarships, and it was kind of back in the the day. It was the top male and top female at Warren County High School. We split schools. Uh, the school has used the Thompson Trust to uh, handle uh, the additional scholarships, but the reality is. You're not, you don't earn a whole lot of interest these days from the bank account. And so, um, you know, between fundraising and interest, we've been able to cover and actually grow the amount. And I think the goal eventually is to get to a point where we could, we could go back to doing two $5,000 scholarships. But um, these are the top male and top female at each of the two high schools. Um, so each of them okay. has a $3,000 scholarship. And I wonder if that wasn't the, the original Warren County Educational Foundation that I was associated back with it back was. in 58. It was. It was your, the teachers there that were part of the retirement system. When that was dissolved, th that ret money in the retirement account went to fund the scholarship. Okay. So that, that's where I graduated. Yes, sir. Well, I'm going to set the Board of Supervisors authorize the use of $3,000 from the Warren County Educational Foundation scholarship account for the awarding of one $3,000 scholarship as outlined. Is there so, a second? second. Yes. Um, well, I mean, I don't think it was ever actually removed from the consent agenda. We just sort of started oh, talking okay. about it. So, so we don't have to say anything. Well, I mean, Mr. Fox, have you actually haven't asked for it to be removed from the consent agenda? You just had a question. Is that fair to say? It is fair to say. I just had a question. All right. Well, then we can just approve this, the consent agenda. I can change my motion to approve the consent agenda? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Then I will change um, my motion and may I move that we approve the consent agenda um, as presented. Is there a second? I'll second that. Any further discussion? Emily, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. May. Aye. Ms. Colors. Aye. Mr. Fox. Aye. Ms. Oates. Aye. Mr. Carter. Aye. Motion carried. <clears throat> Next, we're on item number M, which is the request of Chris Ramsey for a boundary adjustment for the property located off Guardhill Road into the town of Front Royal Limits. Mr. Stanley and or Taryn. I'll I'll go ahead and. Lead off and Taryn, if you're still going up, you can jump in. I missed something. Um, okay. In 2016, the Board of Supervisors considered a boundary adjustment request from Mr. Ramsey to include a 20.2206 acres identified on tax map 20 as a portion of parcel 26 into the limits of the town of Front Royal. The board ultimately adopted a resolution that determined that the requested Boundary adjustment was not needed at the time, was in conflict with the adopted comp plan, 
and the existing development along this portion of Route 637 Guard Hill Road and would significantly impact the functional capacity of the Route 637 Guard Hill Road if developed. In November 2019, Mr. Ramsey resubmitted a re revised request to the Town of Front Royal to boundary adjust the property and the town limits. He states in his letter for the request that the use will be for 150 fair market value rental apartments before it was for senior units. County received a letter from Mr. Waltz, former town manager, on October 30, 2019, stating that the town had received the request from Mr. Ramsey. The letter stated the town was formally asking the Board of Supervisors to consider a corporate boundary line adjustment for that 20.2206 acres located at 3853 Guard Hill Road. The town council considered the request and it's meeting on October 28, 2019, and formally asked the board to consider the request. Additional information was received from Mr. Ramsey, which is included in the packet. Uh, the board discussed the matter at a work session on May 12th, and it was consensus of the board that it did not want to move forward with the request as proposed. A formal resolution to that effect with reasons for the denial is included for formal consideration. And I would note, uh, based on some feedback, we have modified it a little bit to add some language uh, to clarify that this request uh, came from the Town of Front Royal, uh, from Mr. Ramsey through the Town of Front Royal, and that we'll really respond to that town's request. In that first paragraph, we add some language that says, and the Town Council, its meeting on October 30, 2019, formally asked the board to consider such request. And then in the final paragraph, it would state, be it finally resolved, the Warren County Board of Supervisors hereby declines to consent to the Town of Front Royal's request for boundary adjustment of the property identified on tax map 20 is a portion of parcel 26 and consisting of 20.2206 acres into the limits of the Town of Front Royal. With that, um, either I or, or uh, Ms. Logan will be happy to answer any questions. Taryn, is there anything I missed that you want to add? Yes, sir. I'll answer any questions if the board has any. Hey, Tony, I got one thing about the resolution. I see where you updated the language. This is basically coming from the town. The only thing is, where it says that it's meeting on October 30th. The meeting was actually October 28th, town council. Thanks for that clarification, Mr. Carter. Pardon me? Thanks for that clarification. Well, and then the other thing, too, is, if you get that second whereas, it looks like this is basically copied from the uh, 2016 um, resolution, but the most recent thing that Mr. Ramsey's asked for is 150 That's thousand right. units, and not 100. We can change that to 150 housing units. I mean, I don't know if it matters or not, but it's just as I said, his most recent request was. On the 28th, and he also asked for 150, which he brought presented to us too at our meeting. That being said, is um, are we ready for a motion on this? Uh, may, may I offer a suggestion for clarity yes, in your minutes? Maybe the motion would be I move that the Board of Supervisors adopt the attached resolution with the modifications uh, described in this meeting to decline to consent to the boundary adjustment of the property identified on tax map 20 as a portion of lot 26 as outlined. So I will make the motion um, of what Jason just said. <laughs> because I don't think I can repeat it. <laughs> I was trying to write that down. Is there I'll, a second? I'll second that. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to recluse myself from voting on this matter. Uh, like I've previously said, I have real wells for Mr. Ramsey, and although it is coming from the town, it's to me it's much the same, and I feel more comfortable by not voting on this. Emily, could we get a roll call, please? Uh, and Mr. Chairman, are, yes, sir. are you also planning on making a statement to the effect of not voting on this as well? I'm, I just, go I'm just going to abstain. All right. I apologize.
apologize, I missed who seconded. I heard Mrs. Oates. You second? I apologize for that. Mr. Carter? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Fox? Abstain. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. May? Abstain. Next item on our agenda is a request from Warren County Public Schools use of 2018-2019 surplus dollars. Um, Mr. Stanley and um, Mrs. Shepard, she's available. I believe she is on the call. Melody, you still there? I am here. Okay, thanks. So the board, the board has generally encouraged Warren County Public Schools to conserve funds with the ability to have those uh, funds returned for one-time capital purchases. On a few occasions, the school has had to use them for operational uses. Uh, the total of the school's FY 2018-2019 surplus, as determined by the FY19 audit, was $1,623,021. During the FY 2019-2020 budget approval process, it was noted that half of the 2018-19 school surplus would be available to the schools due to the fact we were using $1.2 million of fund balance to cover the budget request. Attached is a memorandum from the Interim School Superintendent, Ms. Shepard, regarding the use of, uh, proposed use of the 1819 school surplus. At this time, they're requesting the return of the entire amount of $1,623,021 for the following uses. For the AS Roads renovation project, $1,076,200. For school bus replacement, $480,000. For the LFK carpet replacement, $66,821. Based on our previous agreement, the board would consider return up to 50% of surplus due to the use of the $1.2 million in fund balance in the budget. That amount would be $811,511. Uh, given the current impacts of COVID-19, the impacts on our fund balance, I would recommend that we not fund the full request. Uh, however, it does make sense to fund the full request of AS Rose renovation project. Uh, that would cost an additional two sixty four six eighty nine, dollars and would allow the school system to complete the project in full this year, uh, particularly since the building's empty uh, right now with the current situation. Um, Warren County Public Schools anticipates significant savings in the current fiscal year. If we appropriate the additional two sixty four six eighty nine, dollars we could state that those funds would be replenished from any surplus from the FY1920 along with the 50% when they asked for consideration of a refund of those funds. And I believe, uh, Ms. Shepard, we feel like we'll have at least probably the same amount as the savings from 1819 in the 1920 budget uh, based on our last conversation. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say as, as long as the sales tax revenue continues to come in as anticipated. Okay. At a work session on May 12, it was the consensus of the board to put it formally on the agenda for consideration. With that, we'd certainly be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for the... Is AS Roads on schedule Do we, for renovation? Do we know? Yes, so AS Roads is actually ahead of at this point, with the building being unoccupied, it has created an opportunity for LCW to really um, get in there and work and um, start the renovations really well. Very good. So if, with the 811511, what would you be able to do with that? Would you be able to complete the roof at AS Roads and the windows? So the if we were to receive eight hundred eleven thousand, we would have to look at all of the items on the on the list that we have, and I'll just go through them really quickly for you. The um, three hundred fifty one thousand dollars was to purchase and install casework and sinks for the classrooms at the elementary school. Uh, Two hundred forty thousand dollars to replace exterior windows approximately $200,000 to replace the existing flat roof. Title I classroom casework, mechanical plumbing, and HVAC would cost another $112,000. And then to include some of those things that we value engineered out of the contract, 
due to funding, which would include an ADA ramp and repair stoop in the front entrance, purchase and install a phone, intercom door systems, purchase and install marker boards, window, window treatments, restore the gable cupola, purchase and install fiber cement window infills, and then re reinstate a contingency at $175,000. So out of those items that I had just listed, we would have to uh, find 200 and, and some thousand dollars to, to deduct from the complete renovation. None of those things have been done in the process so far. You could, I would have thought they would have been, you said you were ahead of schedule. I would have thought most of that would have been done. Right, we were, we are ahead of schedule. The thing is we had a, a $3 million budget, $3,096,300 budget in which we included the items, uh, which in, included the base bid so it included, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, moving the front office to the, uh, moving the office to the front of the building, creating a, a secure front entrance, making the restrooms ADA compliant, doing the demolition of the inside of the building in order to be able to do the renovations, replacing the floor and the ceiling, and the installation of the ductwork for the HVAC equipment. With the additional $629,000 that we received from the Board of Supervisors in November, we chose to put the uh, HVAC equipment to purchase and install the HVAC equipment and I know there was a question Ms. Cullors from you at the la at the work session the other day that why didn't we go ahead and replace the roof and the um, and the windows instead of maybe some of those other things and if we would have replaced the windows at at the beginning of the project we would have had to have taken the window units out of the out of the windows and we would have lost our cooling for the building and then whenever you replace whenever you put hvac units on the roof of a building you are creating roof cuts which could create leaks potential areas for leaking in the future so you know it would be better to install the hvac equipment and then place the roof on after that so that we know that the um, the roof is stable and has created a um, secure um, scene for for the roof so, well, so those I, are some of the yeah. things that um, but the things that are included in the project are things that are getting done now the things that are on this list are things that we haven't we have not asked for funding for at this time they're not part of the funding for this project that's why we're asking for the million seventy six thousand two hundred dollars to, to complete the project okay I, I've just meant I didn't wasn't specifying the order of which you did them was just the thought that it should have been included as a priority to get it done in that amount of money that you had that was my my thought so the the things that are on the list at this time are not things that are included in the current purchase in the in the current project Any additional comments or concerns from this um, board to the staff? <laughs> Dolores or, or, or uh, Mr. Carter? No, sir, not at this time. Then do we have a motion, please? This is this was a hard one. I, Do we have a motion? With if if allocated the one million seven seventy six two hundred, that would be that's what it takes to finish AS roads, and not do school buses or carpet. Correct. Is that correct, Melody? That's correct. And that is how much, that's the 264,689 additional. additional to additional. the 811. How, how bad would that hurt our budget? 
it didn't hurt the budget. The question was, it hurt the fund balance. And I think if, as long as, if, if the board, it was the intent of the board to take it out of next year's return of funds, I think it would save money because it's going to allow them to get this done without having to remobilize later. If the board is to approve the 811 and I, Melody, next year, next January, February, I imagine you come back to the board and ask for the additional money to finish roads next year. It might cost a little bit more as far as your mobilization costs. Is that a fair statement? It is a fair statement. And when is about this time of year when we know what their surplus is to it's, it's going to hopefully it, we actually knew what this amount was back in february march when the audit was complete um, our goal this year is to complete the audit sooner um, we hope by december you'll know what this number will be for uh, fy20 um, based on our new audit schedule so uh, i think their request probably would come in, in in January or February like it used to. Melody, is that in the, in the past that's what we did. You were lagging about a month behind the audit presentation, but um, I know you waited this year. You waited this year to see what you could be able to do with roads as well, right? Absolutely, and we wanted to see what our budget was going to uh, be at the state level as well. Okay. I move that the Board of Supervisors approve a portion of the request of Warren County Public Schools and appropriate $1,076,200 of unspent surplus for the completion of the A.S. Rhodes Elementary School renovation project as outlined. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Any comments or concerns? Roll call, please, Emily. Mr. May. Aye. Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Carter? Aye. Motion carries. <sighs> next, uh, next item on our agenda is the authorization to accept uh, coronavirus relief funds payment to agree to conditions related to the same and to authorize the execution of the certific certification for receipt of coronavirus relief fund payments. Mr. Farrell and uh, Mr. Hamm. Sir, thank you, sir. Uh, as most of you are aware, Congress passed and the President recently signed the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security CARES Act of 2020. This act provides funding for a number of different programs to address the COVID-19 pandemic. A primary component of the CARES Act is $150 billion in assistance to state, local, territorial, and tribal governments for the direct impact of the COVID-19 pandemic through the establishment of the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Warren County's current allocation is $3,504,154 and is based off the annual estimates of the resident population for counties in Virginia. Counties must ensure that an equitable share of the CRF funds it receives are shared with and granted to each town within its jurisdiction. Just as with the funds retained by the county, the funds granted to towns must be spent in accordance with the same requirements and the same documentation must be retained for audit purposes. The county issuing the grant is responsible for ensuring compliance with the documentation requirements and must also ensure that the use of the funds meets the requirements set forth by the federal government. In order to receive our locality's allocation, a signed certification form must be submitted no later than May 22nd 2020 to the Department of Accounts in the electronic or hard copy form. There is no cost to the county or town of Front Royal. All funds must be properly accounted for. Any funds that are not expended or that will not be expended on necessary <coughs> expenditures on or before December 30th, 2020 by the locality or its grantees must be returned to the Commonwealth of Virginia no later than December 30th, 2020 and the Commonwealth of Virginia is entitled to invoke state aid intercept to recover any such unexpended funds that have not been returned to the Commonwealth within 30 days of December 30, 2020. 
The proposed or suggested motion is that Walter J. May, the Chief Elected Officer, Douglas P. Stanley, the Chief Executive Officer, and Carolyn W. Stimmel, the Chief Financial Officer, be authorized to accept the Coronavirus Relief Fund payments to agree to conditions relating to the same and to authorize the execution of the certification for receipt of Coronavirus Relief Fund payments. Are there any questions for Mr. Farrell? So, how, how is this, who is it disseminated to, and how is it? Rick, you want to answer that one? So, the uh, dissemination we can talk to in detail later, but it's approximately a 60-40 split between the county and the town based off of uh, the population. Okay. And, um, and it comes through the county. Okay. It all comes through To the offset county. expenses and things that the county has incurred, or is this... It, it also can be used for things like fire and rescue staffing, uh, sheriff's department. We can get, we can get okay. reimbursement for some other things as well. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty broad uh, as to what we can... It, it's money up front, and then we just have to provide the necessary documentation to support, just like a, a grant. Okay. So, out of this three million five hundred four thousand, forty percent of that would go to the town. Approximately forty percent. That's right. Well, it, it, it's more complicated than that, and we were going to. This that was the subject of the closed meeting that's going to be later on. And Mrs. Colors, there's maybe thirty or forty pages worth of guidance provided by the state and by the federal government on as to what the money can be spent on. It includes lots of broad things. The, the main one to go to is what Mr. Stanley said with respect to staffing for the fire rescue sheriff's department. Um, but there are lots of other things in there. Um, this has all happened pretty quickly. I, I've read it. I know that Mr. Stanley has read it. We are uh, analyzing it. And I strongly suspect that in the future, the board will hear various ideas of, of how to spend this money. <clears throat> Uh, may, may, may I ask? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Hamill, are you suggesting that perhaps we should table this at this time? And for no. No. <clears throat> no, we need to approve it so we can accept the okay. money. It needs to be done tonight. I was going to say. If you don't do it by May 20th, you're saying no to the money. And it's. Of May 22nd. So, you know, the, the all we're doing tonight is authorizing the acceptance of this because <clears throat> it comes with an agreement that's in your packet that has to be signed by Mr. May, Mr. Stanley, and your chief, uh, uh, Carol Stemmel, your chief financial officer. And if we don't act tonight, we don't get the 3.5 million. So we absolutely need to act tonight. Um, but the, the other question that uh, Ms. Colors has asked is, you know, what are we spending this money on? And uh, obviously you've got in your, your, some, your, one of your agenda items is consistently money that's been spent uh, on the coronavirus items uh, is nowhere close to 3.5 million, but these multiple pages of state and federal guidance uh, provide other things that you can spend the money on. You know, one example, okay. there is a presumption with respect to the federal matters that emergency responder, you know, the question, the hypothetical is, well, how do we know how many hours or what amount of payroll to allocate to the firefighter responding to COVID-19 stuff versus other things. And there is a presumption that essentially everything with respect to the to firefighter is to be um, potentially uh, used under this grant. But this is uh, going to be the subject of further study. All the other 70 counties in Virginia and multiple cities are dealing with the same issues. There's probably going to be additional guidance on exactly what we can spend this money on in the future. And um, I suspect that there will be board involvement with respect and some decisions to be made as to how to spend them uh, in the future. But tonight, I strongly urge you to pass this uh, motion because otherwise we won't get the money. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Carter or uh, Mrs. Oates, do you have any comments? No. Well, make the motion, Sheldon. We need to do it. Okay. Um, 
that Walter J. May, Chief Elected Officer Douglas P. Stanley, Chief Executive Officer, and Carolyn W. Stim Stimmel, excuse me, Chief Financial Officer, be authorized to accept the Coronavirus Relief Fund payments to agree to conditions relating to the same and to authorize the execution of the certification for receipt of Coronavirus Relief Fund payments. Second. Any additional comments? Emily, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. Carter? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Collins? Aye. Mr. Maine? Aye. Next item on the agenda is the award for the contract uh, for Warren County Audit Services. Mr. Stanley. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, requests for proposals or RFP for audit services was advertised, posted on the county's website, and mailed directly to a list of 19 firms that perform such work. The county received a total of three responses from the RFP from the following firms, uh, Clifton, Lorison, Allen, LLP, Robinson Farmer Cox Associates, and UHY LLP Certified Public Accountants. An RP review committee consisting of former finance directors Carolyn Stimmel and Andre Fletcher, treasurer Jamie Spiker, and myself uh, independently scored the applications as outlined in the RFP and ranked the firms. On May 12th, the committee interviewed the two highest ranked firms, Robinson Farmer Cox Associates and Clifton Larson Allen LLP. Uh, it was a unanimous recommendation of the review committee to recommend that a contract be awarded to Robinson Farmer Cox Associates. The recommendation is based on the fact that RFC has done an outstanding job in development of past audits for the county, that they are highly recommended by other similarly sized jurisdictions in the state of Virginia, that they did the best job during their interview, and their proposed price estimate fit the county's budget. RFC currently conducts audits for approximately 70% of the 95 counties of Virginia and about 20% of its cities. Given that RFC has had the contract previously, RFC presented their proposal with a different lead auditor. Uh, in essence, another office would handle the audit. Um, this will provide a fresh set of eyes on the county's finances. The committee looked on this change favorably, especially given the concerns of the EDA embezzlement. Uh, RFC has proposed a fee of $50,000 for the FY 2020 audit, uh, and staff recommends the selection of RFC to perform the audit services for the three-year period FY 2020, FY 22, with the potential for up to three one-year renewals. Um, the audit fee for the current, uh, uh, this past audit was $49,500. We also asked the firms to provide a quote for the EDA since the County is the EDA's fiscal agent at this time. RFC has provided a price of $15,000 to perform the EDA audit, and we feel that's in line with what is uh, required and would recommend we approve that as an add-on. Um, it was close to what Brown Edwards, I believe, was all over that amount uh, for the FY18 and 19 audits. They're currently in the process of completing that for the EDA as their standalone. Uh, in accordance with the RP, the contract, uh, again, could be extended for one-year periods with mutual consent of both parties. Uh, due to the need to schedule field work uh, with a successful firm in June, um, we certainly need a decision, I would think, at least by the outset, June 2nd. But um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. A copy of the original RFP is included in the packet, along with a copy of RFC's audit proposal um, as well. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Questions from the board to the staff? Just one. Would you recommend we approve this, move it forward to tonight rather than to wait? I, I would, just from the scheduling standpoint, they have to get with the treasurer, and they, it's about a, you know, a week to a week and a half of field work that happens in June, and then there's field work that happens in September. Once uh, we get through the, you know, for July and August, um, we actually uh, can basically book back the revenue collected. So the treasurer, uh, once the fiscal year officially ends in, in end of June, for them it lasts two more months as far as revenue collection. And I anticipate this year it'll be greater because we've pushed back the, the penalty and interest deadline. But um, no, I, I think, you know, we really looked hard at, at having another firm come in and I think uh, RFC has worked with a lot of communities our size. Um, 
the other firm we interview it typically work with larger you know um, counties like Fairfax and Arlington and some of the other larger jurisdictions I felt especially the treasurer felt more comfortable with the firm uh, of this size <coughs> Additional would questions? Like, would you like a motion? Could we get a motion, please? I move that the Board of Supervisors approve the request to re award a contract to Robertson Farmer Cox Associates as outlined in the amount of $50,000 for the county's audit and 15000 for the EDA audit. Should I get a second, please? Second. Any additional comments or concerns? Where are, they, where, are they, where are they located? So uh, previously, the Charlottesville office ran our audit. That was Matt McLaren. You met Matt because he would come do the presentation. This office is out of Fredericksburg. Okay. So about still about an hour and a half drive, whichever direction you go. But um, it'll be a different lead auditor uh, this time around. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mr. Stanley, okay. so um, there's a different auditor currently performing the EDA audit. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, Brown Edwards is the firm that's handling the EDA audit for both FY18 and 19. So obviously in their schedule, I think to complete that by the September time frame. And okay. they'll, they'll need to be completed so that we can pick up with the 20 because you need your starting balances to use to, uh, for the audit. But of course, since July 1 of uh, 19, the county has been handling all finances for the EDA. So hopefully a lot, a lot uh, easier to, to complete the audit. Is it prudent to use the same auditor for both? I guess you just said because we are the fiscal agent. Is that the yes? So all their primary reason accounts payable, their payroll, um, and their receivable. Everything is running through the county books. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Emily, could we get a roll call, please? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Carter? Aye. And we have a new item P1, Mr. Chairman. Yes. <coughs> item P1, which is the Skyline to State Sanitary District 2020 tax rate. Mr. Stanley, I Mr. guess. Mr. Chairman, board members, as part of the county's budget process, um, the county the board of supervisors approves the sanitary district rates in addition to the county's real estate, personal property, machinery, and tools tax rates. One of our uh, sanitary districts is Skyland Estates. I've enclosed a copy of the FY 2021 budget request from Skyland Community Corp. or Skyland Estates Sanitary District. Uh, Mr. Smullen, the president, uh, had uh, filled that out and was dated uh, February 6th. In the request, uh, he shows a current rate of 35 cents per hundred of assessed value and a proposed rate of 35 cents per hundred. While the 35 cent rate was the requested rate for Skyland in 2019, the approved rate was actually 32 and a half cents due to the fact that the rate had to be equalized due to the county's reassessment. When Skyland Estates made the request for 35 cents, we didn't catch uh, the discrepancy with the adopted rate and we advertised the 35 cent rate in the newspaper. And including my budget presentation, I said showed the current and proposed rate just like it was in the ad at 35 cent. And I didn't highlight the fact that Skyland Estates was one of the sanitary districts with an increase. We had three other districts with an increase. We didn't have any feedback from the public, um, but obviously we weren't showing as an increase. Uh, at this point, um, I actually, and I had a call yesterday from a property owner, and asked, and lady asked me, she said, did they increase the rate? My bill looks higher. And I said, I don't know. Let me go back and review the material. So we uh, identified the discrepancy. I've been talking with Mr. Ham since yesterday, and his suggestion is the board adopt a revised uh, rate of 32.5 cents. I've reached out to the Skyline Community Court President to make him aware of the issue today. I talked to him. Um, and even though the tax bills have been sent, <clears throat> the treasurer, and I talked to Jamie today, she can issue a credit and have that credit applied either to their second half, which would be due in December, or if they wanted to get a refund, they would be able to get it. Of course, some people are going to be coming in anyway, um, and when they ask for their amount, staff can let them know, oh, you're, it's a reduced amount because we've had to revise the tax rate. So because it's reduced, um, Jason, did I miss anything? No, and I 
you know, the board did not intend to raise it, and we did not tell the public we were going to raise it, so I would be strongly urging for you to, to fix this tonight. Uh, even though the bills are wrong, um, we can still uh, clean up and, and do what we had intended really to do. If the bills are wrong, but we can make it right. Yes. Do we have any, any additional comments or concerns? Yeah, actually, what we're doing is just making it what it should have been to start with. If they're, what they're going to pay. Absolutely. If yep. we, had, you know, if we had picked up on it, we would have had the advertiser rated thirty-two and a half cents, and it never would have been an issue. Right. And uh, you know, Gary was, and I told Gary, I said it's on us too for not double checking it, Gary. It's no big deal. But um, you know, we want to make it right and make it what it's supposed to be. Right. Would you like a motion? I would like a motion, please. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Board of Supervisors adopt a revised 2020 Sanitary District tax rate for Skyland Estates of 0.325 per $100 of assessed value. Do we have a second, please? Second. Do we have any discussion? Emily, a roll call, please. Mr. Carter? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Baker? Aye. Next item on our agenda is the uh, general public comment period. The agenda public comment period is an opportunity for citizens to give input on issues on the board's agenda which are not the subject of a public hearing and is not intended as a question and answer period. Uh, Emily, has anyone signed up or do you have questions or concerns? So I received emails from two individuals. Okay. And I've also put a call out on the YouTube live stream just to see if anybody responds. They haven't yet, but we'll see. So the first one is from Mr. Chris Lang. This is the email that he sent to the board members and he asked for it to be included in the general public comment period. The Board of Supervisors are to serve the residents of Warren County. The Front Royal Golf Club was deeded to the residents of Warren County 82 years ago. It is the responsibility of the supervisors not to defund the golf club, but to figure out ways for the golf club to continue to serve the county. There has been a lot of talk that there are four other courses where residents can play golf, but two key words have been left out of the conversation, affordability and availability. The courses in this area advertise to golfers outside of this area for golf tournaments and membership recruitment. There are many times when our four courses are not available for public play. I spoke to Richard Runyon from the Shenandoah Golf Club, and he said that most of his membership is from Clark County, Loudoun County, Frederick County, and Winchester City. And the River Radio Station recently had interviewed the general manager from Blue Ridge Shadows Golf Club, and he said tournaments were a big part of his business, and they advertised to other states for golf packages. Both courses host high school golf team events. All of these factors have not been mentioned or considered when you were talking availability for golfers that are, are, that are in Warren County. I encourage you to make some calls to all of the courses and ask them to send you the events that they have already planned for this year. And you will see that availability to play is and should be a concern of the board. Now let's talk about affordability. The average income for a two-person household in Warren County is $62,500. Has anyone on the Board of Supervisors compared the golf rates from all four courses compared to the Farm Roll Golf Club? Just in case you have not, I did the research for you. My research clearly shows that it is not only an availability issue, but affordability is a bigger issue that has not been considered. Counties typically provide an alternative recreational services to their residents, especially when the other money-making businesses that charge a higher fee for the same type of service, this provides everyone in that county the ability to participate regardless of their income. The trend of municipal courses are growing in popularity because of this reason. They do not compete with member-type courses, they complement them and encourage golf play. A lot of first-time players of municipal courses graduate up from that course and go on to buy membership at other courses, play in tournaments, or visit that course on occasion to play a longer course, and some stay due to the reasonable rates and relaxed atmosphere. When I go to the Front Royal Golf Club, I know I need to wear my patience hat, but other member courses are not always as patient with new golfers, older golfers and walkers, and maybe that is because of the expertise of the player, higher greens fees, and membership. But there should be an alternative, and we are lucky enough to have one in the Front Row Golf Club. Did you know that municipal golf courses make up 17% of all courses in the United States? This means we have a golf course for our county residents that 87% of counties do not have, and know of none other in the Valley. Municipal golf courses are almost always open to any golfers who want to play. That separates municipal courses from private golf clubs, which are typically members only, 
and from semi-private courses which might restrict times of play for the general public, and that is understood that they are there to make money. A golf course that is open to the public but privately owned, not owned or ran by a government entity, can be called a public course or a daily fee course. It is the ownership structure that differentiates such courses, although daily fee courses tend to have higher greens fees than municipal. Although municipal golf courses may earn money, cities and counties typically do not have a profit motive. Their primary mission is to provide reasonably priced outdoor recreation for local residents. On the one hand, newspaper headlines indicate that municipal courses are closing, or on the verge of closure around the country. But on the other hand, research by the National Golf Foundation throws a curveball at this narrative. There have never been more municipal golf courses in America, according to the NGF, as some cities are buying up floundering courses and taking a proactive stance against redevelopment. The numbers recently released by the NGF indicate growth for municipal golf. The number of municipal facilities, not total courses, but single facilities owned and or operated by a government entity, grew from an all-time high 2,497 in 2017. That accounts for roughly 17% of the total United States golf facilities out of 14,794 according to the NGF's latest report. The golf committee has been working on new daily fees and membership fees. If we can get 100 members, we can cut the budget in half. If we can lease the kitchen for $1,500 per month, that could reduce the budget by another $18,000. These two items equal $88,000 minus the annual budget deficit of $138,000 equals $50,000 as the new deficit. Also, our part-time greenskeeper with his experience is unheard of. He has reduced his fee from $100 per hour to $50 per hour, and his hours are expected to be less than the previous year, and we do not pay benefits for him. His payment for employment was roughly $160,000 of the budget last year. If he were to work three days at $50, the total would be $62,400 for this year's budget, and that is a savings of $97,600. The Front Royal Golf Club appears to be a soft target for this new board. Another set of board members accepted the responsibility for the Front Royal Golf Club, and since that decision has already been made, let us work together and try to figure out a solution to help cut the budget. I would like to point out that this board has only reviewed one solution for the Front Royal Golf Club, and now you are ready to let it grow over. I understand that the Board of Supervisors members do not play golf or know anything about the golf business, but please do not penalize others because of it. A golf course is not considered an essential service, but taxpayers do pay for parks and recreation, and this municipal course is now part of that department. There must be a statement to the board of super by the Board of Supervisors to the public that we are open for business and we will be open in the future. This statement would increase business. The bad press has ruined this business. And next is from Mr. Gary Kushner of 1106 Fetchit Road. Uh, his first section is titled Board of Supervisors Public Meetings. While live streaming the Board of Supervisors meetings and accepting emailed comments from the public was an attempt to continue to enable public participa participation in Warren County government, it has not, in my opinion, provided an adequate level of interaction between the citizens and their representatives. As we are now much more aware of the nature of the COVID-19 challenge and the mitigations that are available, it is important that actions be taken to ensure that citizens have a greater opportunity to participate in their government and communicate with their representatives in person. As such, I recommend that the procedures utilized at the last board meeting where the public was able to attend in person be reinstituted. The board room is large enough to permit the safe, limited attendance of the public with use of reasonable phys physical distan distancing, area sanitation protocols, and use of personal masks as necessary. Thus, I hope to be able to address the Board of Supervisors in person at their June 2nd meeting. His next section is titled Warren County COVID-19 Lockdown. Several months into the COVID-19 saga, Warren County and the Shenandoah Valley continue to be minimally affected by this health challenge. With a population of over 40,000, there has been only 103 positive virus cases, 11 hospitalizations, and two deaths in Warren County. This is clear evidence that the one-size-fits-all restrictions imposed by the governor are not justified. Certainly no one wishes that anyone gets sick or lose their lives with the novel virus, and reasonable efforts should be taken to address that possibility. However, the restrictions are affecting all of the population where only a very small percentage is at risk. The very elderly and those with serious underlying health issues should limit their exposure to the public and practice increased hygiene. The rest of us should practice physical distancing, pay greater attention to hygiene issues, and wear a mask when appropriate. Continuing the governor's restrictions is tearing at the fabric of our society. While the virus challenges our physical health, the restrictions are diminishing our mental and economic health. 
The fear that this is being caused by the government and media is itself affecting our immune systems, making us much more susceptible to all diseases. As such, I encourage the board to join with the Town of Front Royal in requesting special authority from the governor to address restrictions based on the health and experience of our local community, rather than the broad brush approach now in place. With the safeguards mentioned above, Warren County can be opened up so all businesses can operate and the public can begin transitioning towards a thriving, successful, and satisfying life that existed prior to the virus. The governor's phased approach will take too long, and the societal damage already experienced will be exacerbated. This board was elected to represent the citizens of Warren County and not be a blind advocate for ill-conceived edicts of the state government, regardless that they might be well-intentioned. The citizens of this county are mature, responsible, and free, and don't need benevolent rulers to make decisions on what level of risk to take with their health and lives. Open Warren County to business and life. And let me check and see if we have any comments. And we don't have any comments in the YouTube live stream, Mr. Chairman. Unless there is anyone in the audience that would like to speak, don't speak on the agenda. Um, final call, please. The agenda public comment period is now closed. We need a motion to go into closed session. I move the board enter into a closed meeting under the provisions of section 2.2-3711A8 of the Virginia Freedom of Information for the consultation with legal counsel regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. I further move that this discussion be limited to the impl implementation of the coronavirus relief fund payments. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, any discussion? Roll call, please, Emily. Mr. Carter? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Main? Aye. We're now in closed session. Whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready. I did not mean that ever be ready. <laughs> Could be here a long time then. Okay, I move the board certifies to the best of each member's knowledge only public business matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements under section 2.2-3711A8 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and only such business public business matters were identified in the motion by which the closed session closed meeting whew, it's getting tired now was convened were heard discussed or considered in the meeting by the public body second any additional discussion emily could we get a roll call please mr carter aye Ms. oates aye mr fox aye Ms. colors aye mr Mead. aye um, is there any additional business? Hearing none, um, motion for adjourn. So moved. Second. Any additional discussion? Roll call, please, Mrs. Um, Emily. Mrs. Emily. Howard. Mr. Meade. Aye. Ms. Colors. Aye. Mr. Fox. Aye. Ms. Oates. Aye. Mr. Carter. Aye. I want you all to hear me. Y'all did well tonight. This is a lot. We covered a lot. Thank you.